The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio. Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Any rebroadcast, reproduction, or other use of this broadcast or podcast without the express written consent of Spaced Out Radio or Spaced Out Radio Limited is strictly prohibited. Listener discretion is advised. Buckle up, space travelers. It's time to go for a ride on Space Out Radio. Mr. Bumblefoot, Dave is ready for liftoff. Seriously, Dave? Really? Aren't you a little old for a tinfoil hat? I am. Toby. Bye bye. Love you. Space Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, and it's good to have you along for the ride on this Friday, April 21st, Saturday, April 22nd. If you're on the East Coast, hope you've had a great day and night. We are live right here in Uncle Jimbo's cabin, right here in the Great White North, as we are live seven days a week. We welcome in all of our terrestrial radio stations. WQEE 99, Rock the Key, down in Noonan, Georgia, home of the Walking Dead. We are also live as well on the United Public Radio Network on 107. 7 FM in New Orleans and over 160 countries around the world. We are live on spacedoutradio.com on Spreaker, KTLK, the Fringe FM. I just wrapped up an interview with Joe Roop there, and I see a few people coming from there into our chat room. Good to have you with us. We're live in Las Vegas on Renegade Talk Radio, the High Plains Talk Radio Network, and if you're listening in on Revolution Radio, remember the Double R Machine is a donation station financed by you, the valued listener. Head on over to freedomslips.com and donate today. All of our theme music is dedicated by Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal, formerly of Guns N' Roses, currently of Art of Anarchy. Bumblefoot is the official music of SOR. Hey, if you're a social media junkie like I am, do me a favor. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, you can follow me at Dave Scott, S-O-R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Tune us in on TuneIn. Download our shows from iTunes. We're also on RadioGuide.fm, TalkStream Live, and Stitcher. Our website, of course, is spacedoutradio.com. And if you go over to patreon.com for as low as a dollar a month, you can become a patron of SOR. If you want to take part in this show, sign into one of our chat rooms by clicking on our website, click on Listen Live. It'll take you right to the chat room there. We're also in the chat room of Revolution Radio on Spreaker, on the UPRN chat room. Or, if you're a valued member of the SOR Space Travelers Club on Facebook, good to have you with us tonight. We also welcome in our crowd on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. It's good to see you all there as well. Use the hashtag Spaced Out Radio if you have a question or a comment. I will get to that as well. If you head to our website for just 5 bucks a month, you can become a space traveler with our team. You can also check out our brand new news section called The Encounter Online. It deals with everything paranormal, courtesy of editors Eric Markham and Everett Themer. You can also check out my latest blog there as well. And if you've had an experience you can't explain, do me a favor. Fill out an SOR Sightlines report. Our researcher, Mike Schmidt, is ready to find out what's going on with you. 
On the evening of March 13th, 1997, down in Arizona, a night of mystery, conspiracy, and intrigue enveloped the cities of Phoenix and Tucson. Strange lights started appearing out of nowhere. People stared up at the sky by the thousands to see what was going on. They couldn't believe their eyes. And history was made. A covered-up history that 20 years later, it seems to be brushed aside like it almost never happened. But the video footage of a chevron of lights appearing in the night sky over Phoenix hasn't been forgotten. It's one of those rare instances where the media jumped all over the story, followed the next day by Governor Fife Symington making a mockery of Arizona citizens at a mock press conference with all reporters in attendance with a fake alien coming into the press gathering in handcuffs. Yes, the Phoenix lights were born. The mystery was born. The intrigue. Yes, it was embarrassing for the people, but two decades later, even former Governor Fife now admits he saw the lights too. Tonight's guest, David Spinks, is a paranormal investigator from West Virginia. He was in the Air Force during this occurrence. He was stationed in Tucson. He's never told this part of his military history story before in public, until tonight. David was scrambled to his Air Force base after his shift on one of the weirdest and scariest nights that he can remember. David Spinks, welcome to Spaced Out Radio tonight. How are you? Hey, great, Dave. Um, How are you doing, man? Thanks for having me on. I'm really glad that you are on, my friend, because I'll tell you, the world of ufology, we always seem to focus on Roswell. We seem to focus on Area 51. And we're going to get into this heavy tonight about why you think the Phoenix Lights are the forgotten anomaly in the field of ufology in the United States. And we're going to get heavy into this entire topic. And I appreciate you coming on for the first time to talk about this publicly. After 20 years, Dave... What made you decide that this was the time and Spaced Out Radio was the place that you needed to discuss this story publicly for the first time? Well, I mean, as a military member, Dave, you know, um, you you kind of swear an oath to keep stuff secret and keep, you know, your opinions to yourself for national security purposes, okay, if you will. Um, and it's been so many years since uh, I was there during this incident that I feel it's just time for me to come out and talk about it a little bit, you know, um, give my opinions on it and what I think happened. Now, let's learn a little bit about you. You now live in West Virginia. You are a paranormal investigator who works closely with a previous guest on this show, David Weatherly, who will be coming on in just a couple of days again to talk about haunted toys. And what an amazing guy he he is. Did you, before this oh, incident, before this incident in Phoenix, did you believe in UFOs? Did you believe in the paranormal? How Or was this kind of the start of everything for you 20 years ago on March 13th, 1997? Um, actually, it wasn't, Dave. I had already had some beliefs and some experiences as a young man. And I was already pursuing some answers to some of these questions. You know, as I say, my mantra kind of is, if you read my website, you know, um, I I always ask these questions, you know, um, what happens to us when we die? Are there unknown creatures among us? And are we alone in the universe? You know, um, I've always sought answers since a young man, you know, uh, to some of these questions. And one of the reasons I did go in the military was to become a trained observer you know, and then later on in my professional career, I went into federal law enforcement because I wanted those investigative background tools to help me in my search, if that makes sense to you. So it's been a lifelong passion for you in learning this stuff. Were you always inundated with it as well as a child? Was it something that sci-fi intrigued you, whether it was ghosts, whether it was UFOs, or was it something that you just kind of, you know, brought yourself to as you started looking in? And and like you said, you went from the military to the police where investigation was a part of everything. Yeah, um, really the thing I think that really stuck out in my mind um, was a story my mom had told me when I was a little kid. I mean, I was a baby when this happened, so I have no recollection of this, but 
I was one year old and my mom and her aunts were in a car and I was, they had dropped me off to my grandma and grandpa's and they were going somewhere. I don't know that part of the story where they were going. I think to the store or something. And they were hit head on by, uh, of all things, a, a drunk preacher driving us a church bus. Um, my mom went through the windshield and came back into the car and half of her face was pretty much ripped off, but it was hanging there. Uh, my aunt was hurt very bad too. Um, my mom tells me the story of what she remembers as laying there outside the car and this really young guy came up to her and took his shirt off and he ran down over the hill there and got his shirt wet in the creek and put it over her face. And she said that all she remembers is he had the, he had this strange glow around him and really bright, like, uh, you know, around his whole body. And he kept telling her things are going to be okay, okay. Well, she said the next thing she remembered, she must have passed out from blood loss because the next thing she remembered, she woke up in the morgue, cold, freezing, and couldn't move a muscle. And they had already you know, thought she was dead because of the amount of blood she lost and could not get a pulse on her when they took her pulse. So they, you know, chalked her up as being dead. And all of a sudden her aunt comes kicking through the door and said, she's not dead, damn it, you check her pulse one more time. And they did, and sure enough, she had a pulse. And there you go. There's, (laughs) you know, that story my my mother told me uh, really stuck in my mind. And, you know, she said many for many years she tried to find out who this young boy was that uh, essentially, you know, helped save her life. And she, no one remembered seeing him at the accident scene. No one talked to him, um, and she never found out. So right there, to me, was a very you know strange story of what was was this a real person? Was this an angel? Was it you know what was this? Um, and I started seeking answers at a very young age and through the years I, I had several experiences that even made me pursue what I do now even, even further. So you have a lot of fun with this. This has kind of been your passion, your desire to try and find out what is going on. And let's face it, just because that incident didn't happen to you, but it happened to your mom, you're going to believe your mom. And I could see where that would have affected you from being such a young child into what you have become today, not only a paranormal investigator, but an experiencer as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've had numerous things happen in my life that lead me to believe there's something else out there, you know, and it's also, you know, some of man's greatest questions, you know, those three things I mentioned earlier, I mean, you know, that are, it's like the unknown, you know, and can we find some answers to some of these things that, have no answers yet and you know it's a a hobby going crazy if you will i do have to ask you and we'll get more into the paranormal in hour number three because i know everybody's excited to learn about the phoenix lights and everything that you saw but what is your opinion you you just said something to me that kind of triggered something for me And I usually like to run with that because on this show, you know, we have format, but we have to be able to react. You mentioned that you're trying to find life's answers. What are those answers you were trying to find? Well, I mean, I think one of everyone's answers, everyone's questions, rather, is what happens to us when we die? You know, um, are we energy that just transforms and goes somewhere else? Or are we just living beings that die and that's it? You know, that that's, you know, one of the main reasons I do what I do, along with I want to know, you know, were we some kind of uh, alien DNA experiment here on this planet? Or, are you know, are we, do we come from evolution? You know, I want to know, you know, and I, I think that, in my own personal opinion, the, the universe is too vast for us to be the only intelligent type of living beings in the universe. I mean, that's just, the numbers are just astronomical on the odds of that being the, the truth. You know, I, I, I have a hard time thinking that we're the only intelligent beings in the universe. And I'll tell you why I asked that question is a couple of nights ago, we had 
members from a paranormal team who are also part of the Taps family come on this show. And I mm-hmm. can I can feel the cringing from my my listeners right now as I bring up this topic. But as someone who believes that we should be solving the mysteries of life like you are, okay, and I'm very happy to hear that, by the way, I, I was absolutely dumbfounded to learn that this very popular group doesn't care about solving anything. And really, it only seems, maybe it was just this group, but they said this was a TAPS formula, okay, that that they're really there to prove whether or not a place is haunted. They don't follow up with any evidence. They'll sure give the evidence to the client, what they found, but after that, it goes into a storage bin that might as well be buried six feet under and never thought of again. And I was very, yeah. And I was very disappointed in that. Because we have so many people who are affected by paranormal anomalies or ufological anomalies or cryptid anomalies. And we have a giant base of people in a very popular group like TAPS who's basically saying, we're sending you to a haunted house to prove if it's haunted or not. That solves (laughs) nothing. And how do you feel about that? Well, I mean, <clears throat> I think it all goes hand in hand, really. I mean, we're, we, you got to go to try to document evidence of the unknown in some fashion, you know, to do that type of investigating. Um, you know, what is being haunted? You know, if they're just doing it that way, then it doesn't make any sense to me. You know, I mean, um, what are you actually trying... What what's what are the basis that you're going to say the place is haunted or not off of? You know, I mean, I don't know. I just that that's that boggles my mind a little bit. It blew me away. It blew me away that literally they do not. They admitted this group admitted they do nothing with the evidence. Sure, they may capture some EVPs or a shadow person on video or 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 something along those lines. But after they leave the client, it's over. It's done. That's it. You know, not offering any solutions, not offering, you know, to get help in order to to clear the spirit and everything. And we'll get more into the paranormal later yeah. on later on in the show. But we brought you on to talk about the Phoenix Lights because back on March 13th, 1997, which I'm sure you remember the date very vividly. Yes. You were you were just a soldier in the United States Air Force doing your yep. thing, doing your job. I want you, if you don't mind, to take us back to that day, previous to that day. In your time in the military, did they ever talk about UFOs or aliens? Maybe not in a private conversation with the boys over a beer at the bar or a poker game, but I'm saying military conduct. Did they ever talk to you? about what happens with UFOs, or was that a need-to-know information? No, that was never discussed. Um, anything that you, anything out of the ordinary, you would, of course, report it to your supervisors, and it would go up the chain of command, and then that's it. You know, if you're just a little man on the totem pole at that point, and uh, it would be totally on a need-to-know basis, really. And, um, you know, I had some friends that were also pilots um, and I'd often ask them questions and they just would totally shun that question, you know, and and they would give me a look like, you don't, you know, you don't want to know answers to that. (laughs) You know what I mean? And it would just aggravate me to death because I was like, man, don't you want to know? I mean, more, you know, and you know, they had seen things in the sky and they just do not talk about it. Had a pilot ever opened up to you about what they saw? Um, I have one buddy that I went to high school with, and I actually ran into him while I was stationed in Tucson. And, you know, I had asked, and this is before what happened happened, you know, from the Phoenix Light situation. And I asked him, you know, have you ever seen anything strange in the sky? He said, yeah, man, uh, many times. And, I, and he, he didn't go into great detail. And he just said, man, you know, I said, well, what do you think? You know, what was it? And 
And he said, well, he goes, I'll tell you like this, Dave. He said, it's nothing we had. We have. <laughs> you know, and then he would just, and then he just kind of blew off the rest of the question and then that was it, you know. And um, it just drove me crazy because I know these guys have seen crazy, crazy things in the sky and they just, they don't want to talk about it because, you know, they swore on us too and they don't want their military records to be messed up in any way, shape, or form, which is understandable, you know. Yeah, I can very much understand that. I mean, there is a pedigree for excellence in the military and you want to be at your best on space you know on on the base and, and in front of your peers and in front of your colleagues and especially the ranks above you and the military you know being so strict you really have to watch your p's and q's at times what you say what you don't say and so i can understand where your pilot friend was was being quite hush hush about it because you never know who's listening or where they're listening and that that's right. the, that's the truth of it i mean I mean, or even them, they they could be part of an upper echelon that you don't know about. So you have to kind of be, you kind of have to tread lightly yourself when asking certain certain people questions, especially an officer. You know, you know. I mean, you just you don't know who's involved with what when it comes to things like this. So you really have to tread lightly. And uh, the only reason I talked to him about it and a couple other guys because I knew him real well and. You know, the other guy shunned it off right away, and he 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 talked just for a minute about it, but that was it. You know, he he hush hush too. I mean, he he doesn't know I could be involved with something, you know, or sent to ask him questions or something about something he's seen. You just don't know, you know. So, where were you stationed at this time? Um, actually, I was stationed at Davis Monton in Tucson. It was my first duty station when I went into the military. Um. I was there for, I was there in 1993. It was my first uh, year there. And I, I'll tell you more about, I got sent overseas shortly thereafter the um, Phoenix Lights incident. So as with many, many other people from that base got transferred all around the world, which I found very interesting. Well, we could get into that. I, I, tell people what Davis Monthan Air Force Base is like if they've never maybe been near an Air Force Base or know the area of Arizona very well. Um, it's it's in, like I said, it's in Tucson. Um, it's out in the desert, in uh, right on the outskirts of the city. It's an A ten Warthog training base. Uh, I'm sure most of you have heard about the A ten. They call it a tank buster. Um, it's a low flying close quarters combat aircraft, um, carries a lot of armament and it's a very slow flyer, but it's specifically made to give troops support and blow tanks up basically. And it's a, it's a wicked, wicked machine. <laughs> and how many of those aircraft were on the ground at Davis Monthan? Um, well, I don't know the exact number, Dave, but it was three full squadrons because it was a training base for A-10s. So probably maybe 100, maybe 100. Okay, that's a lot of aircraft. I mean, yeah. liter literally, I can tell you, that's that's more A-10s than the entire Canadian Air Force with CF-18 Hornets. I mean, that's just an estimated guess. I mean, I never went out there and counted them on, but there was three full squadrons. I mean, you know, anywhere from... Somewhere between 40 and 100, I would say, easily. And during, <laughs> during this time, since it was your first posting, what was your job in the Air Force at that time? Um, my first job in the Air Force was actually um, MWR, Morale, Welfare, and Recreation. I came up with programs for the troops, um, you know, for recreational purposes, uh, even in the field. You know, I was in charge of doing, you know, bringing in movies and activities on for the guys when they're on their off time. So that was my first job. And, uh, you know, cause my, what well, my first background in college was physical education and it kind of just filtered right into the military, you know, and my stepdad was in the air force and I was an air force brat growing up and I loved the military life. So that's, that's what I started doing when I first went in. 
Did you always want to be in the Air Force? Was this a lifelong goal for you, or was it just because you didn't know what you were doing out of high school and figured, well, I might as well go serve in the Air Force and see where, if I could find some direction? Well, actually, um, what led me, I love the, the, you know, the concept and idea of the military, but that, that wasn't my first career choice. I was actually a baseball player in college, and I wanted to play pro baseball, and I had a full ride at uh, in college, you know, the whole time and playing baseball. And I, my, when I was 22, I was in my senior year, and my mom, the one I was telling you about earlier, she got killed in a motorcycle wreck. She was on the back of a Harley Davidson and fell off and broke her neck. My little brother was still in high school, so at the time. I was uh, only making a little bit of money playing baseball. I was playing the rookie ball down in Florida. And my brother was still in high school, so I decided to go into the military to help help him finish high school and and have a career and all that. So that's long story short. So let's head to March 13th, 1997. What was your day like? before you got called back? I was a normal day, uh, uh, day shift work, you know, and I came, I had come home at about 4 or 4.30 and took some food out on it. I think we, I grilled out at the time that night and was just kicking back in the chair about 7 o'clock and I'm watching TV and the phone rang. And it was a, it was a recall. And during a recall, you know, that's, something that happens when one of two things are going to happen is you're, you know, an exercise or you're going to war. And what struck me funny was normally when we had an exercise coming up, everybody kind of, you know, had a heads up, Hey, we're going to have a recall, you know, we're going to do an exercise for a week, you know, basically a war exercise. When I say exercise, that's what I'm talking about. But this one didn't, you know, it doesn't, didn't say exercise on the phone. Like usually a lot of times it'd say exercise, exercise. I mean, we had a certain area that we would report to each unit would report to, and you would go in and you would start arming up and they had doctors in there and everything, making sure you had all your shots and all, you know, and you go through this big line and you get handed out your gear and all that stuff. And you wait for, to get on aircraft. Well, we got called in and, I just, it struck me as funny. I was like, man, there's no, we didn't get no heads up on this one. What's going on, you know? And so, you know, you got to throw, jump in the, throw your uniform on real quick, jump in the car and run down there, you know, to the, to the echelon point. So I got in there and what he's, you know, it's, it's very busy. You know, there's guys everywhere. Officers are already dressed out, giving orders, you know, you know, you're getting in line, getting all your paperwork squared away. And there's, there's also chaplains in there saying, you know, anyone want to need to do a last will and testament, that kind of thing. And it's standard when you, you know, even when you do an exercise, that it's all like real world. You know, they do it as close to real world situation as possible. Well, I was noticing on some of the lieutenant's faces and stuff, they had a really worried look on their face, but they were, you know, trying to hide it and being professional and, we, you know, some guys were asking them questions. Hey, what's going on? You know, is this an exercise? What's going on? They'd say, shut your mouth, get in line, you know, get it done, all this stuff. And, you know, it usually takes an hour or two to get everybody packed out and ready to, ready to go. And after everybody was ready, you know, we just took a seat on the wall and waited. And you could hear the jet, you know, you could hear the what what struck me as really funny too is you could hear A ten after A ten after A ten taken off. I mean, you couldn't even count them all. And everyone's just looking around, this worried look. You know, we're, we're like, are we going to war? What the hell's going on here? You know, no one knew, and they were just telling everybody, keep it down, keep your mouth shut, and we're awaiting orders. That's all we knew. You know, and we stayed there all night. I mean, we didn't get released till the next morning, like seven thirty, eight o'clock in the morning. And we went back to the house and, you know, everyone was just in a conundrum wondering what the hell that was all about, you know, and no one said shit, you know, I mean, it was just, all right, go home, you're released, go back to the house. So 
So we chalked it up as really some kind of crazy exercise, you know, see how fast we could get down there and get ready. But all night long, man, you heard A-10s taking off, and it was something way out of the ordinary. Well, as I said, you chalked it up as an, a weird exercise, something out of, the, out of the blue that maybe the commander of the base wanted to do just to see. But then you see the governor coming on TV the next day with an alien suit on, you know, talking about the Phoenix lights and this and that. And I'm like, wow, okay. Was that, you know, what the hell was this? Well, you didn't really hear much after that until it made national news. I think it was in what, June, July. And all these people were coming out, you know, in between that time saying they saw a light from the sky. You're talking thousands of people. So I knew right then and there that it was a real world situation and something big went down and it was a mass cover up, you know, and I was like, man, I was in the middle of that and something really went down there and, you know, it just blows your mind away to know that, holy crap, man. I mean, they don't just, you got to look at it from a military standpoint. They, they don't just do that for no reason. You know, they don't muster out all those people and they don't freaking launch aircraft after aircraft for no reason. If it's a training exercise, they're going to do, you know, maybe a one, one flight of six aircraft, you know, and go out and do their bombing run and come back. I mean, that's it. Not, not a half a squadron or more of airplanes. So previous to you, getting the you get the call what was that drive like back to the base what was going through your mind at that on, point i lived uh, i lived on the base at that time so it's just like a three mile run down to the area where we get ready so um yeah it was you know i it was basically driving there and driving home i mean you just wonder what the hell it was but when they're telling you to, you know, keep it down, keep your mouth shut, and, you know, you're on, you know, you'll know when we know, basically. And that's how it always is in the military, you know. If you're on a need to know and you don't need to know crap right now, that's basically how it goes. But you couldn't help but wonder. And then, you know, during the following days, I talked to some of my buddies and stuff, and they were like, yeah, man, that was crazy. You know, everybody was talking about it. And then when... You know, guys were talking about the governor coming on and then all these people coming out talking about it, what they saw, and then we knew that that's what went down. But you just didn't, you know, and there was definitely some kind of cover-up because what those folks saw were not military flares. I'm sorry. I've seen thousands of military flares coming out of aircraft, and those are not flares. On the base... You mentioned that everybody was wondering what was going on. Did you know that in the vicinity of the airport, there was this black triangular wing, almost like a boomerang, seen flying over? Nope. nope, we didn't know anything. We didn't know what was going down. We didn't know that people were seeing these, this craft in the sky, you know, or these lights. We didn't know nothing. We were just called in. You know, and that's, we only found out later that, hey, man, this is something really went down here and they were getting ready for something. You know, all of us were, we were all getting ready for something we had no clue about. And it was really kind of really unnerving to find out about it afterwards, you know. When you guys found out about what it was, how did you feel as part of the military at that point? Like me personally, <laughs> me personally, if I would have witnessed that or put it this way, when I had a black triangle hovering over my house and me and a couple <laughs> of friends were on my patio watching this thing and it was only a couple thousand feet up and we watched it disappear in the cloudless sky, like it, like a door opened up in the sky and it flew right in. And as it was going in, the undercarriage of the lights were going off one by one by one and then there was just nothing there i remember how mortal i felt and how scared i was because that's not supposed to happen was there a no. lot of that was was there a lot of that type of attitude going on at that time dave oh yeah i mean a lot of guys were talking about it on the base for months you know after the whole 
the whole um, incident happened, you know, man, people were like, man, what was that? That was crazy. And, and all, you know, you had all the civilians talking about what, you know, and, and well-respected civilians talking about it, not just, you know, Joe blows over there drunk and he saw something in the sky. You had what doctors, you had lawyers, you had, you know, people that had a reputation to protect and they came out and told it, you know, like you, what they saw. So, and if you couple that with what happened to me, you know, I knew something happened. I knew something otherworldly happened. I mean, what it was, I didn't get to see it. Unfortunately, I wish I would have seen the crap, but like I said, I was locked in a building all night. <laughs> so, but we knew we were a part of it and, you know, I don't know, man. It's just unnerving. We, you know, when you're in the military, you're just a number and you're, you know, you're, you're paid to follow orders basically. And that's what you do, you know, and you don't question it. You just go on about it. You know, guys talk within each other about it, but you don't go to the upper brass and just talk about it. It's just not the way things work. And they're, even if you did, they're not going to tell you anything. If anything, you'll get yourself in trouble. <laughs> You know what? I know the A-10 Thunderbolt or Warthog, whatever you want to call it. I love the plane. I remember as a kid in the town I grew up in, they had one of the largest air shows in the world. And when I was like 12, 13 years old, this A-10 pilot had his cockpit open, and he actually let a couple of us kids go up there and sit in it in the cockpit. And so I've been in a, co I've been in a cockpit of an A-10, and he let us hold the bullet from the Gatlin gun that's on the front nose of it. Okay. And here's, here's my small kid hands holding this almost foot long bullet. And I was just like, wow, this is awesome. You know, going back then. But the one thing I also learned about the A-10, and I agree with John at hashtag spaced out radio on Twitter. It really makes you scratch your head, and I don't mean this in a laughing way, that they would scramble 50, 60 A-10 Thunderbolts at a top speed of 439 miles an hour to try and catch up to what could be interstellar aircraft invading. Right. I mean, yeah, it doesn't make sense, but that's all that was in the area besides Luke Air Force Base. So, you know, I mean, who knows if they scrambled... I'm sure they, they scrambled Army uh, choppers from Fort Huachuca that's down south south of Tucson, too. You know, who knows what all went on military-wise there. But, you know, if something, if you got to look at it this way, if something that we don't understand and, and we don't know exists is inter invading our airspace, the military is going to throw whatever it has in the area at it, you know, and have it on standby. I mean, that's just the way it works. When you saw the aircraft leaving Davis Monthan, were they loaded with armament? I didn't see him, Dave. I was in the building. Remember, <laughs> I just oh, heard him. Yeah. Them. Okay. All right. <laughs> would you assume? Yeah, you could just hear would, them off. Would you assume then that they would have been fully loaded if this was not a training exercise? Oh yeah, if it was not a training, they would have been loaded with you know. They have guys there ready to load them, full lo fully load them, you know, within minutes, each aircraft, you know. And even when they when they fly out at night like that, they usually go out to the, you know, they would go out to the Barry Goldwater bombing range and run, you know, run their practice runs. And they, they use uh, really a lot smaller bombs than they would use in real-world situation when they do that. But they're still loaded, you know, they're loaded with um, live rounds in the Gatling gun, the live missiles, and live uh, bombs. So, you know, I'm sure there was enough in the very get-go that were already pre, you know, they keep some that are loaded all the time on standby. So, you know, um, it would only take them, you know, they could probably have a lot of airplanes ready to rock within 30 minutes, I would say, to an hour. I'm still amazed that you had the the rush of this experience, and this is why I wanted to bring you on, because there is so much to this story. As the days after approach, you said there was a lot of chatter going on regarding uh -huh. what was what happened that day between the civilians who worked on base to fellow military personnel did any of your ranking officers ever talk about anything like this or were they told to keep hush about it um i know i heard some 
some scuttlebutt, you know, of guys asking the COs what the hell went on, and they pretty much told them, oh, it's just an exercise, don't worry about it, you know, and just would shun it off like that. And, and, you know, nobody really, you know, you just, you don't question. You just don't question stuff very often, and, you know, that's just not what you do in the military. If you do, you are you can get yourself in big trouble. You know, they'll give you a direct order to shut your mouth, and that's what you do. And I can understand that. I can appreciate that. So were you like a lot of other people on the base who, after this happened, you started reading any type of news reports? I mean, the Internet was just oh. in its infancy back then, so you couldn't really yep. head on to any type of website to find information. So what did you go through personally as you started your own personal investigation trying to figure out what was going on? Well, I would, you know, I would try to get any, whenever I found out when the, the new papers would come out, you know, I would watch them and to see if there was anything new. And I mean, it was talk. there was, it was every day there was articles in the paper from somebody, you know, someone else claiming to have uh, witnessed these, uh, aircraft in the sky. And I mean, it was, it went on for months. I mean, people were coming out of the woodwork saying, I saw it. I, I live here up on the mountain. I saw it, you know, people were just coming out of the woodwork and, um, it was crazy. It was a crazy scene for quite a while, and especially after it hit national news. I mean, people started really coming out because, you know, a lot of people are afraid to come out and say what they saw because they the fear of ridicule, you know, and, oh, you're crazy, whatever, you know, that type of thing. But once it hit national news, man, it was the talk of the town. I mean, everybody was talking about it, even in, you know, I didn't live in Phoenix, but I lived in Tucson, and, you know, the craft was seen all the way down in, in Tucson, too, and out south of Tucson, and a lot of people saw it, you know, and it was the talk all over the place. People were talking at the stores, the gas stations, everywhere you went. So how long did this whole thing last for you? From the time you got called in until the time you were allowed to go home or when they gave the all clear, how long was that? Um, it was over 12 hours. I mean, they, I got the call, I think it was right around 7 o'clock p.m., and we didn't get released till I think it was 7.30, 8, 8 o'clock in the morning. So it was a 12-hour ordeal of sitting around wondering what the hell's going on. You know, are we going to war? What You know, what's, what is this? <laughs> At any point, and, at any point though, Dave, did you think you were actually going to board a C five or a C seventeen or a C one forty one and start making your way to some unknown country? Was that the initial thought oh, yeah. right off the bat? Yeah, we were waiting. You know, I mean, there was a lot of activity in the, in the area. You know, uh, officers coming in and out, talking, having meetings, and all this, that, and the other, and. We just never got the the call to get on the, on the aircraft. There was C one thirties parked right outside, you know, um, and deuce and a half and everything else, you know. So we didn't, you know, we just sat we just sat there and waited until we got our next orders, and the next orders was go home. <laughs> so you know, but it was so surreal because it was so much different than any other exercise that we had. We knew there was something else to it, but. You know, nothing was ever said to us or anything. It was way out of the norm. And, of course, once the news broke all over the state and then national news, we knew, I knew, I knew that that's what it was. I mean, we were on standby basically for what may occur or what may have happened, you know, with this, with these people seeing these crafts. At that point, when you're wondering and you're thinking you're going to war, you don't know that there's UFOs flying over your area no. at that time. Where did you think you were going? I'm sure there was possibilities wondering where the hell you could be going to start a war. Well, one thought was um, we might have been going to Guantanamo Bay because at that time the, uh, the Haitians had that big uh, government overthrow down there. And... Needless to say, we, uh, we'd we already been down there once. Um, my unit was down there. I was down there for four and a half months on a joint task force, so we figured, well, maybe we're going back. And that's that's kind of like the same type of thing that happened the first time we got the call, and 12 hours later, man, we're on an airplane going to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. So, you know, 
that's how it usually happens. Your unit gets called and tasked to do a to do a job, and you go down, get your gear, and load up. I mean, that's basically what happens. Um, so that's what we were expecting. We didn't know where we were going to go, but we were ready to go, you know. And um, that's that's the, the the really the skinny of it, you know. But then you find out about all this UFO talk and. I'm just like, wow, that's what that was, man. There was something major going on. There was a major freaking sighting all over the state of Arizona, and we were there. <laughs> so take me through your feeling, knowing what you went through. The first time you saw the infamous the infamous uh, video of the lights coming on in a Delta-type formation. Oh man, I was like the hair on the back of my neck stood up and I, I just put it all together right there and I just knew that's what happened. I was like, Holy crap, man, there was some major, major stuff going on, you know, and they were getting all the bases ready because they didn't know what it was either. Apparently, you know, and, uh, I, it's just one of those feelings you can't describe was like, I mean, I was just like it, exhilarated, but also kind of freaked out at the same time, you know, because you're, I'm sitting there thinking, man, if that, if that was some kind of otherworldly craft and I could have been right there in the midst of it in the middle of a freaking interstellar war or something, you know what I mean? It was crazy. <laughs> and I'm sure after that video came on, the famous video taken from a mountainside where you see the lights turning themselves on everybody on the base must have had an opinion of that oh yeah that's what you know when they when everyone started figuring out that's what the hell was going on they they was just the talk of the town they're like can you believe that i mean that's what was going on that's why everybody got recalled and everything else i mean it was just nuts i mean it was nuts you know and and people just had this bewildered look in their eyes when, you know, when you're talking that it, between your, amongst yourselves about it, you know, people, you know, you could tell people had genuine concern, like they really realized, holy crap, man, there's something else to this. What is, you know, what the hell is going on here? Because if it, obviously if it was one of our crafts, why would the bases be scrambling jets and everything else? It doesn't make any sense. Common sense tells you that. Well, if it was one of ours, why would we scramble all these people, you know, and have them ready to go to war? I mean, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So you're sitting there thinking, man, I mean, what the hell was this? There's, is, you know, does this really happen? I mean, what the hell? You know, it just blows you away to think that, holy crap, you know, there there's something else out there and it's not of this world. Mm -hmm. How many times did you study the lights like how many times did hit, you hit rewind on the VCR at that point, trying to oh, figure man, out I, what the hell was going on? Well, I did a lot of it, you know, Dave, because you know, as I told earlier in the show, that I grew up on a military as, a, as an Air Force brat, and I grew up on Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico um, for several years. I was out there and. I knew I was also in the Civil Air Patrol, and we were, you know, I was trained in learning all the silhouettes of every known aircraft, you know, uh, that weren't, you know, that unless it was top secret and it was not to be known. And I've been to many, many air shows over my time and walked circles around stealth bombers, stealth fighters, every freaking aircraft that's in our arsenal that the, you know, the general public and actual military members know about, and these things did not look like anything we have and, and you know at least that out there in the public eye and let me tell you something when you walk around a, a stealth bomber that thing is awesome i mean it's just unreal it's huge and it's ma it's just a massive wingspan on it and it doesn't look like you know it looks like an alien craft but this v-shaped thing and the size of this thing, and to be moving at the speed it was, and, and without making a sound, but a whooshing sound, I mean, we don't have anything like that that I know of. Um, you know, it's just, it's mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. And you know what, I, I'm a big-time military aircraft fan, too. And, you know, 
I remember the first UFO I saw. I was like 21 years old, and I remember it sounding like a C-130 Hercules, but it just seemed a little bit off. And you being around military aircraft all the time, 24-7, basically living on Davis-Monthan Air Force Base, you get a good taste of what what sounds are there? Your ears become attuned to what a C-130 sounds like, or an A-10, or an F-15, or something along those lines. You're just trained for it, aren't you? Oh, absolutely. You you can pick out aircraft off the sound they make. An A-10 has a very distinct distinct sound. An F-15 has a very distinct sound. You know, it seems like just like you said. I mean, all these aircraft. You can tell when you're around them so much what, what they sound like and what they are, and you can call them out without even seeing them, you know. So, yeah, you're exactly right on that. That's a great point, you know. And it when you see stuff that, and you hear all these people's reports and they're talking about this thing was so huge and it wasn't making any sound, I mean, that just, that's just that's a telltale sign that something's just not right. I gotta laugh. My wife is freaking out upstairs right now because the northern lights are out up here. Flash oh, around us. So in like two and a half minutes, I'm gonna disappear for a couple of minutes. I want to go see the northern lights because they they're, 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 they're well. I haven't seen them the bright green yet. I haven't seen them the bright green. The last time I saw them, they were white, whitish pink, and whitish orange. So I'm hoping they're green out there because I want to see them. So. I'm looking forward to it. I'm all geeked out about the Northern Lights over my house right now. That's kind of cool. <laughs> you don't get that in Arizona or West Virginia. No, you don't. No, exactly. But back to our conversations. We have about two and a half minutes before the break. I'm wondering, how did that change your entire perspective in regards to UFOs, coinciding with the military because when you're living that experience right off the bat it has to be has to be uh me or let me put it this way it has to make you question what is real and what is not and what is really out there oh absolutely i mean it really invigorated me dave uh, when i when i put two and two together realized what had really gone down and what was transpired has tra- had transpired that night. It really invigorated me because, you know, being interested in it and then actually experiencing a, a, a part of that event, I, you know, I didn't see the craft or anything, but I was a part of it per se. Um, it really invigorated me and I, it just sent me off to the next level of really, you know, just, seeking out and searching more out about th- these these craft and these this possible um intelligent creatures from uh, other planets and whatnot you know it really invigorated me and um i consider myself very lucky to even have been and even though i was a minuscule part of what transpired um i consider myself very lucky to have been there because it almost was an enlightenment to me if that makes sense Absolutely. And David, we're going to get you to hold on here for a few minutes as we are going to take our first break of the night. And I'm going to be honest with you, man. During the break, I'm going to abandon you for a couple of minutes because I I, I definitely want to see the Northern Lights. I mean, there's just something beautiful about them if you've never seen them. And like I said, I've only seen them a couple of times, but I've never seen the green. So I am literally running outside here for a couple of minutes during the break. I'm gonna try and get. A, I'm gonna try and get a picture or two. I gotta now delete, delete some stuff off my phone, you know, because I got too many pics on there right now. But you're listening to Space Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott. David Spinks is our guest. We're talking the Phoenix Lights. Hour number three. We'll get into some paranormal as well. We'll be right back right after this. From coast to coast to coast, Black Light Uncharted is taking on the paranormal across Canada. From ghostly hauntings to the UFOs flying above in conjunction with MUFON Canada, they're closely investigating what's going on in the northern skies and checking out the apparitions that walk among us. Check out our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. We want to know your thoughts, we want to hear your experiences, and we want you to share your stories. The answers are out there, and we intend to find them. Would you like to become one of our space travelers? All you have to do is click on the space travelers icon at spacedoutradio.com. 
For only $5 a month, you can get access to some great prizes, as well as private monthly shows, newsletters, and a members-only section on our website. Become a space traveler today. The third Monday of every month, Spaced Out Radio is going to bring you a different look at everything paranormal. Welcome to The Reporters. Jim Mallard, Vanessa Hogel, Denise Garcia, and Christina George join me, Dave Scott, for a look at the weird and strange from the other side of the microphone. We'll break down ghosts, UFOs, cryptids, and the people investigating them. The paranormal media has never been heard like this. Come listen to The Reporters. It's paranormal news at its finest. Welcome to The Encounter. At spaceoutradio.com, The Encounter Online is SOR's trusted news source for everything weird and strange going on around the world. This is news editor Eric Markham. Our team of journalists are scouring the planet for those strange stories that rarely make the mainstream. No fear-mongering or fake news here. Head over to spaceoutradio.com and encounter The Encounter. Hey, this is Canadian Paranormal Investigator Mike Moore. The third Wednesday of every month, I'll be teaming up with Dave Scott to bring you Ghosts of the Great White North. Each month, we will bring on guests from across Canada to discuss their ghostly encounters. Canada is a paranormal hotbed with stories you've never heard, so we're going to bring them to you. So get comfy on your Chesterfield, grab a donut, and join us, eh? Have you had an experience you can't explain? Had a run-in with ghosts, maybe Bigfoot, or seen lights in the sky? Hi, I'm Mike Schmidt from the SOR Sight Lines. I'm here to investigate your sighting. Head to spacedoutradio.com and fill out a report on the sight lines. All your information is 100% confidential, and I will help you figure out what you've been seeing. File your report, and let's find out the answers together. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit. And expect a miracle. Are you interested in advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Head to our website at spacedoutradio.com and click on our advertising tab. There. You will find an assortment of ways you can get your product out there with us, from radio commercials to banners and social media. Have a product you like our hosts to endorse? We can do that too. Visit spacedoutradio.com for more details. Have you got your Cosmic Passport? If you need one, tune in to Cosmic Passport on Spaced Out Weekend. This is Elizabeth Anglin, ET experiencer, spirit medium, and host of Cosmic Passports. Each weekend, I'll be bringing you interviews and support from other paranormal experiencers and the best in intuitive spiritual guidance from across the globe. It's all happening starting at 9 p.m. Pacific Time, midnight Eastern, on spacedoutradio.com. From British Columbia to Northern California, Pacific North Weird has Cascadia covered. Check out our feature videos at spacedoutradio.com, where I... Vincent Zunza and my super sleuth partner Alexandra Sullivan track down the weird and strange stories from around the Pacific Northwest, from Bigfoot to Mel's Hole and everything in between. This is what makes life exciting. So why report the normal when we can report the Pacific North Weird? Right here at spacedoutradio.com. Oh, there's only one way to rock, loud and proud. In high definition, Radio 702 Rocks, Las Vegas. Every Saturday and Sunday night, as Dave Scott wanders aimlessly in the wilderness, you can come hang out with me, James Tyson, and Spaced Out Weekend. Starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, I'll take you along as we talk with some of the best experts in their fields. SpacedOutRadio.com is the place to find us. So sit down, relax, put your feet up, enjoy the topics like the paranormal, supernatural, intuitiveness, 
and so much more. Hope to see you there. Don't have time to listen to Spaced Out Radio Live? Wherever you are, the car, the office, the shower, or even if you're traveling, we're right here for you. Each Spaced Out Radio show can be found on iTunes, TuneIn, and on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. It's the perfect way for you to catch up on our shows. For more information, just head over to our website, spacedoutradio.com, and tune in to us today. The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio. Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. And hit us up on Twitter using the hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Welcome back to Space Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. I'm a little buzzing because during the break, I actually ran outside and the northern lights are literally sitting right over top of Uncle Jimbo's cabin. I tried getting some pictures. I got one that is really faint. I'm going to try and post it to Twitter here momentarily. But man, there's nothing better than watching the northern lights. I'm kind of jealous right now that I'm not outside watching the dancing going on up in the sky. It is absolutely beautiful. Hey, tomorrow night and Sunday, Uncle Jimbo James Tyson and Elizabeth Anglin are back for Spaced Out Weekend. I will be gone. I'll be having my zen and my chi moments for the weekend, trying to figure out life and the meaning of it. But don't worry, we're taking care of with Spaced Out Weekend starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time at spacedoutradio.com. We want to say thank you to everyone who has participated this week on the show, including David Spinks tonight. We'll get to David momentarily. But first, we want to welcome in everyone listening in on WQEE 99 Rock the Key down in noon in Georgia. We're also live in New Orleans on 107.7 FM, the United Public Radio Network, and over 160 countries around the world. Good to have you with us. We're live on KTLK, the Fringe FM, live in Las Vegas on Renegade Talk Radio. And if you're listening in on Revolution Radio, remember the Double R Machine is a donation station financed by you, the value listener head on over to freedomslips.com and donate today oh my god bill really i have no idea what this password is because bill sets a password each and every night right here on spaced out radio i'm gonna butcher this i don't even know it's like 20 letters long pseudo pseudo hypopyrethroidism or roidism thyroidism pseudo pseudo hypopera thyroidism i have no idea if i got that right but that is your password for the night here on the mighty sor if you want to follow us on social media you can be like john be like skeptic be like eric be like cleo and follow us at hashtag spaced out radio on twitter our handle is at spaced out radio give our facebook page a like spaced out radio show you can tune us in on tune in download this show and others on itunes we're also on radioguide.fm talk stream live and on stitcher our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you including joining the sor space travelers club for five bucks a month you can also head on over to patreon.com where you can for one dollar a month, become a patron of Spaced Out Radios. Now we bring in David Spinks, paranormal investigator in West Virginia. But during the nineties, in the late nineties, he was in the United States Air Force, stationed at Davis Monthan Air Force Base when the Phoenix Lights occurred twenty years ago last month. David, welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. I'll tell you, I- I'm still buzzing over the Northern Lights right now. <laughs> I don't blame you. That's a cool sight to see, I bet. Maybe the northern lights that are over my house right now were the same weird lights over Phoenix on March 13th, 1997. I highly doubt it, but just maybe. 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 Yeah. You never know. You absolutely never know. Anyways, my friend, I would absolutely like to continue this topic because that is the topic du jour of the night. And right before the break, we were talking about what the word was when the lights were shown on television. 
Did you think at all at any time, David, that we could have been looking at some sort of military flare going off? Like, we often see flares being dropped by helicopters or or jet fighters. Jet fighters obviously looking a heck of a lot different when they shoot their flares. But that was the excuse that was given by the military at that time. What was your opinion of that when that scenario came out? Well, I mean, it didn't make any sense to me because, you know, with with a lot of the flares the aircraft put out, um, depending what they're for, you know, they simply, they drift downward in a downward, uh, you know, motion, and then they go out, and they don't, they maybe last for five minutes tops if they are the parachute-driven ones, you know, uh, floating down with parachutes, and the way these lights were traveling, I mean, they were traveling in a vertical direction from north to south. So it doesn't make any sense to me, you know. Um, I think the some of the reports were that were given by the weather stations were the wind direction was blowing from the west to the east to the north and then blowing to the south. I mean, it supports maybe the hypothesis hypothesis that it could have been flares, but they were just the lights were seen too for too long in the sky. I mean, it went on for uh, several hours. You know, the sighting all over the state. So it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. It doesn't make common sense anyway. So then, let me ask you this: because obviously, everybody on the base would have been talking about this for days, weeks, maybe even months. When that video came mm-hmm. out, everybody becomes a pro at what they saw. That's what we do. We're humans. What was, right. the, what was the attitude around the base when that video came out? What were you guys talking about? What were the scenarios or the hypothesis on what was going on? Well, the, most of the guys, I mean, the guys, you know, we had small groups of guys, you know, you just didn't go out talking to people you weren't familiar with, you know, that much. But the consensus was with all my friends and the guys I was in with that uh, it was nothing that we had, you know, and um, it was simply they were they all pretty much thought that it was some type of UFO for sure, you know, and whether it was controlled by alien beings or not, that's a different story. But you know, we don't know. You know, it was definitely something non-conventional, you know, uh, in the sky that anyone had ever seen before. And from the reports of the size of these, this craft. I mean, it was massive. There, people were saying it was more than three or four football fields long. I mean, that's huge. Um, I don't know anything that we have that's that big and doesn't make any noise when it flies. Yeah, and we certainly—I've uh, never seen anything in that in that shape. The uh, um, only thing even close to that would be the stealth bomber, and I mean, you're talking it would take. 25 of those to make the size of this thing they were talking about, you know, the minimal. Mm-hmm. And, they're, and they're not quiet when they fly either. <laughs> Did your trust in the military start to waver a little bit when you started to hear the flares theory coming out? Well, I, I personally immediately thought it was some sort of cover-up. I mean, you know, um, and I understand... In, in a lot of different, uh, for a lot of different reasons, why there would be a cover up of something like that. Because if you got to look at it this way, I don't agree with it, but if you look at it from this standpoint, if, if they came out and just said, okay, we had an unknown craft flying in our airspace, um, number one, that's going to create a, a massive panic uh, for a lot of people. Number two, it's going to undermine the authority and the power of our military uh, to the people. Okay, Um, if there's something that can truly travel through space and time, um, we don't have anything of the sort, and we really couldn't probably, our weapons probably wouldn't even touch anything like that, to be honest. And they they would, I could see them doing that just for the simple purpose of uh, stopping a mass panic, you know. I think they. I think the government knows way, way more than they're telling us um, personally, and uh, I just hope one day we can have full disclosure. You know, because I think people need to know. I think 
I think technology has advanced far enough for where people could actually handle it, you know, a lot better than, say, in the Roswell days and whatnot, you know, if that makes sense. The next day, or within the next day or two, Governor Fife Symington comes out in a press conference because the press all wants to know what was going on. And he absolutely, in a lot of people's minds, made a mockery of the citizens of Phoenix and Tucson yeah. who saw these boomerang-shaped craft that, like you said, were three to four football sizes, football field sizes in length. When you saw the governor of Arizona come on publicly with that press conference where they brought in the alien suit, the guy in the alien suit in handcuffs and everybody was laughing, making a mockery of the entire situation. What was going through your mind when you saw that? Oh, it was, it was very aggravating, you know, because here you, you know, you you have a supposed leader of the state, you know, um, who people look up to and look for answers and they made just a whole joke out of the whole thing. And, you know, when you have that many people reporting what they saw in the sky and they were seriously concerned and worried and probably even scared, uh, you know, it's, it's disheartening to, to an extent. Did you lose respect for him and the government officials yeah. in, in general, because they were trying to sweep this yeah. under the rug? Yeah, because it was obviously a, a really weak attempt at, at some type of cover-up. I mean, it really was. And, and I think they didn't mean it to be, to make fun. I think they tried to just lighten the atmosphere, but it came out just really, really bad. And it really made him look bad, in my opinion, at the time. And a lot of people were, you know, a lot of people were really pissed off about it, to be honest. I mean, they were like, what? You know. He should have been, if anything, he should have been more professional and more, you know, to the matter of fact than doing what the way he did it. And my, that's my personal opinion, but, you know, he should have held himself a little more professional in a more professional manner. You talked to a lot of people over the years who were in Phoenix who saw those lights. Did they feel like they got a slap in the face, not only by the governor, but the military and the government federally as well? Oh, absolutely. People wanted answers. They wanted, they wanted answers. They're, you know, people are a lot more savvy than the government gives credit for, and, the, and people are smart, you know, and they know, they know when they smell a rat, if you will. And <laughs> that, to me, was very, very uh, a really weak and lame um explanation for what people were seeing flares just does not cover it man it just doesn't and they were people were pissed i mean they wanted answers of what the hell was flying in the sky that night you know and then if they could have came out and say oh it was just some kind of government crap then people would have you know people would have accepted that over this flare thing you know it was really like a slap in the face to most intelligent people you know what was your reaction then when a few short years ago, Governor Symington actually came out publicly and said that he witnessed the lights, and now he's changed his tune that mm -hmm. he believes there was a UFO over Phoenix and over Tucson? I think it was. Uh, I mean, I think it was awesome that he did that, and I think when he was governor too. I would say the, the government all the way up to the highest levels probably put a lot of pressure on that man, you know, to say, this is what you're going to say. And that's it. You know, um, you know, over the years, how many stories have we all heard of people's families being threatened by mysterious men in black and whatnot over these sightings and things? Um, who knows what transpired that night, you know, uh, or the, between the time of the sightings and when he came out and did his first press conference. So I thought it was awesome that, you know, I guess his conscience maybe have got to him and he knows what he saw and he came out and told what he saw. And I thought that was a stand up job by him to come out and, you know, retell his story of what him and his family saw. There was that tells also, a lot to the point that it was a cover up, you know. Absolutely. But a lot of people, though, 
were even more insulted that he did come out and say that he saw them because there was a lot of people who said Governor Symington is only doing that to become relevant in the Phoenix area once again. It's possible, you know. Uh, it's possible with politicians. Who knows? I mean, but if, you know, if he saw what he saw and he can't, I mean, all he can do is come out and say what he says. I mean, unless someone can say, well, I know you lying and prove it. I mean, what are you going to do? It's, uh, you know, there's, everyone has a story to tell. And if you weren't there to know it's a false story, then what are you going to do? You can't disprove it, you know, so you just got to go with what they tell you, you know, and, I don't see a guy like that, you know, if he was be trying to become more relevant in, in the Phoenix area, whether to gain respect back somehow or not, but I just don't see him coming out and saying, I saw a UFO. I don't think that, I think that would actually hurt a politician a little more than it would help him. I don't know. I To me, why not come out right at the beginning and, and investigate it the way he could have? Do you think then that Governor Symington was shut up either by his own disbelief, maybe his media team, maybe the military, maybe a phone call from the president? What do you think happened there? And I, I realize it's a hypothetical question, but the mockery he did afterwards to come out 15, 18 years later and say, yes, I did see them. That, that to me, tells us somebody who has either been shut up by someone or he was too embarrassed to admit that he saw them as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's quite possible that he received a phone call from somebody very high up in government and said, this is going to be the cover story and that's it, and you will tell it. <laughs> I mean, I think that's a very legitimate and possible thing. Whether that actually occurred or not, who's to say? But, um, you know, it's just one of those things when you hear all these type of cover-up stories going on, the same thing happened at Roswell and, and many other UFO sightings, you know. So uh, it is what it is when it comes to that type of stuff. I don't know. It was It was fishy. It was very fishy. Yeah, definitely, and, definitely was fishy. Did you ever take the time to study the flight patterns of these UFOs? Um, just a little bit. Um, I mean, I saw, uh, we did, you know, I did see a lot of the, the eyewitness accounts uh, in papers and whatnot. And, uh, you know, over the years, as the Internet became more available to everyone, you know, there's many many different uh, reports and flight patterns that have been drawn up and stuff like that. And there was numerous, there wasn't just one craft, you know, and then uh, what was it? They saw it again in 2007 and 2008, I believe a, a very similar thing happened again. And uh, of course the air force came out and said it was just flares at Luke air force base. So, you know, um, there's a lot of reported sightings that go that don't make as big as news as this one did all throughout Arizona, um, almost numerous times a year. You know, um, it's one of those, uh, states and areas that have a, a lot of UFO sightings. Cause you can see, I mean, if, like where I lived in Tucson, you could go up on the Mount Lemon range there and you can see for miles and miles. It's just clear open desert. And when it's a clear night sky, I mean, you can see a long, long way and the sky is absolutely beautiful. And you, I mean, you can see the stars like you wouldn't believe either. And, you know, it's just one of those prime locations where things, you can just sit there and sky watch all night and see all kinds of crazy stuff in the sky. I want to get to some questions from our audience before we continue. Jeff is asking, was there ever any type of debriefing after the fact with you guys basically telling the troops you didn't see anything or hear anything? Nope, there was nothing. It was it, that's why I found so odd about it initially. Is like they just said, "Okay, go home." You know, you're you're done. So we're like, "What the hell is this?" You know, everybody was just looking at each other like, "Whatever." And, and by that time, you're sitting around because you're all, you know, when you first get called in, you're all amped up, you're ready to go. You you know, you don't know what's going on. You're ready to get into fighting mode and all that kind of stuff. 
But then you sit there for hour after hour just wondering and waiting and wondering and waiting. And then they just say, go home, and you're just like, well, what, what the hell was this? Was this an exercise? What, what, you know, what was this? And you're just kind of left dumbfounded. You know, there was no outbreak. There was nothing. And it was just highly, highly unusual, the whole scenario. But later, it did get unusual. As you stated in the first hour, many of the people who were stationed at the base at that time got unknowingly transferred out. <laughs> yeah, when it, like in the Air Force, for instance, I, I don't know how the Army and, and everyone else does it. I, I'm pretty sure it's similar. You have what they call a dream sheet, and you pick, like, there's you get like 10 picks um, of the top locations you'd like to go, you know, for your next duty or whatever. Um, and you do that during basic training. You've picked your top 10 in order. And I think I got, I think Davis Mothin was like my third pick. Um, of course, everybody picks like the cool location, like Hawaii and stuff like that, you know, but you're very lucky if you get to, get one of those well i got my third pick so i was happy you know i mean it was close to kirkland where i grew up and um i was familiar with the area somewhat so you know i went there but um right after that incident um one of the picks on my dream sheet was aviano italy and my enlistment my first enlistment was coming up and out of the blue i just got called into the office one day and uh the first sergeant said, Hey, you got orders. I said, I got orders. My enlistment's coming up. I haven't even re upped yet. And he's like, Oh, you got orders to Italy. I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah. So sure enough, you know, uh, me and a bunch of other guys, man, we got transferred all over the world. I mean, different locations. And it was almost kind of weird. It was, you know, like, why is this happening now? And I actually had to say, okay, I want out of the military or I want to re up to go to Italy. So I chose to re up and I went to Italy for, um, almost five years. I was over there and, um, it was just really weird how it all transpired. It was almost like they wanted to get everybody out as many people out of there that were there during that time. You know, and that what that event happened in March, and I was on my way to Italy in August. So, and it was still, you know, the talk of the town, you know, what happened, you know, even up right until I left, people were still talking about it. I'm sorry, I, maybe I missed it. How long after this happened did you get your transfer? Well, it happened in March, and I was on my way to Italy by August. <laughs> So, you started noticing rather quickly that other people started getting transferred? Yeah, a lot of my friends were getting orders all overseas, all different places. And we were just like, hmm, that's kind of strange. You know, not usually this many people out of one unit don't get transferred that, you know, that, that much together. You know, so it was really, uh, I don't know, man, we, we were just really thinking, man, this may have something to do with this. But we, you know, we could never say that. We never had any proof of that. But it was really uh, just out of the ordinary, you know. It's almost like they tried to transfer everybody out of there to keep it quiet or something. I don't know. That is crazy. Crazy indeed. I want to get to another question from our audience here. This one comes from Ron. And he is asking, did the threat level for national security rise during this incident? What actions were taken by the missile silos? Because you're doing all this research. Were you looking at to what else the military was doing at that time? Um, no, I didn't get that in depth into that. You know, and of course, we would never know that at the time that it was going on. Um, where you just, you know, it's like unit by unit, you know, you're told to go here, be there, and that's it. You know, you don't know. The only people that would have access to that information is the upper echelon of officers, you know, um, and we wouldn't be told that unless it was like, you know, dire straits, at the, you know, unless we needed to know for sure without a doubt. So um, I would say even if they did change the threat con level during that time, nobody knew about it, you know, only the upper, upper, upper echelon of people would know have known about that. Jeff is asking, did you ever hear from any pilots 
or friends on the base if the A-10s ever got close enough to engage or confirm the sighting of a craft? No. Uh, my buddy that was a good friend of mine that I was there with, he he was not there at that time. So he he wouldn't have known. He was already transferred out. And, uh, you know, because like I said earlier, you know, I, I've been researching and, and uh investigating the paranormal for years before I was ever in the military. And I had just thrown questions at him since he was an officer, you know, and he flew, he flew a tens and he was actually TDY at my base. And I happened to run into him and, you know, he was there for a few months, I believe just training. And that happened, uh, earlier the year before that this incident happened. So, um, but of course I questioned him, you know, like I said, and, uh, didn't I didn't know any other pilots per se? You know, you don't really associate with uh, officers and enlisted very often. Only the ones, the guys that I knew a lot, that I seen a lot. You know, I would talk to them in passing a lot. So, other than my buddy that I went to high school with. Did you ever talk to anybody who has investigated this? I know Dr. Lynn Katai down in phoenix has a website dedicated to the lights trying to figure out what was going on she was on the weekend show here just a few weeks ago talking about the phoenix lights i'm wondering did you did you or have you since then talked to any ufologists about it no i haven't dave I, honestly i've kept it quiet you're the first time i've ever come out and spoken publicly about this now david weatherly knows about it i've told him about it um you know because it's just one of those things I kind of sat on, you know, I, I look over site, you know, websites and I look over reports and, and things like that, but I have not put myself out there in that aspect up until tonight. It is so tough to try and figure out what actually happened that night. I'm wondering in your own personal investigation, because that's what you do for a living or had done for a living. Is it something that still bothers you today? Or is it just one of those cool experiences, Dave, yeah. that you just, you know, kind of write off and say, yeah, I was there. No, man. I mean, I really want answers. I'd love to know more information. And, um, because I was there in the midst of it and I, I want to know what the hell happened. You know, I want to know more. And, you know, I know something happened, I, and I believe I believe most of the reports I've seen from some of the witnesses, there was a, a police officer, there was a, a, a doctor and a lawyer, you know, there was, well, really, you know, good people that reported this. That, you know, they, they stood to, lo to lose things by reporting this, you know, their practices and their, you know, a police officer, you know, you got to, as a police officer, you know, when you go out there and say you saw something in the sky or little green men, you know, you're really uh, putting yourself at risk for possibly putting, be putting on mental leave. <laughs> you know, I mean, honestly. And, you know, when you, when those type of folks come out and talk with it, and, you know, in recent years, a lot of the astronauts are coming out and talking about things they've seen. So, you know, you put all this stuff together, then there was something that happened. It was a major incident, and uh, I want more answers, man, to be honest. So, and I, I just wanted, you know, it just struck me as now was the time to come out, and I was on your show listening, you know, I was in the chat room that night listening to my buddy David Wesley and you guys talk, and it just came out of nowhere, and I said, yeah, man, I'll, you know, and then you messaged me, and I said, oh, yeah, I'll go out and finally talk about this a little bit. There's a lot of skeptical people out there who believe that it could have been some sort of solar flare from the sun, maybe, like we talked about earlier, flares, maybe something to do with, with the stars aligning in a certain way that just kind of looked a little bit off guard or off kilter. Hell, even Chinese lanterns have been used as an excuse for this. What makes you think that this was something non-human or non-earthly compared to, say, an earthly scientific explanation? Oh, well, because of the eyewitness reports and, um, you know, with the amount of people that saw it, the, the, the way they flew according to the eyewitness reports and with what transpired at the bases, there's just no way in hell they were, it was any of those things. No way. I mean, there's no way. Um, 
don't know if anyone's ever lit in a Chinese lantern, but they fly upwards and they go with the wind and they don't stay in a, they don't stay in a, in an even distance apart, you know, <laughs> they're going to go wherever the wind takes them. And, you know, those lights, if, if you read all the reports and stuff, they're all at an equal distance apart. And it was, people saw a massive object in, that the lights were attached to that was blacking out the stars. So, you can't say that was a solar flare. You can't say that it was Chinese lanterns or even military flares. It just, there's no way in hell. <laughs> I got a question from Michael here. He is asking, David, do you know about the reports of the craft in areas outside of Phoenix? When? When are you talking about? Well, during that day, you know, there were said to be, what, two craft in the sky? Did you know oh, that? Yeah. Did oh, yeah. You... During that day, yeah. Yeah, there was several reports of uh, multiple craft. Um, you know, you had the main big one that was seen from Phoenix all the way down to Tucson, and then there was another one seen, um, let's see, where was it? It was, uh, I'm trying to think of that area, the name of that town, uh, Prescott, was it Prescott or Prescott Valley, I believe? Um yeah, so I mean, there was numerous sightings that whole of it, and there was I think it came out. People figured there was two different crafts at, at different times, um, if I recall right. And uh, one was really big, and the other one was smaller. And then there was also reports of like an orange, orange, small ball type craft that were moving around too. Um, that were not military flares either. And they seen they, they people reported that there was um, like a round you could see a round metallic shape around the lights of those uh, orb orb type uh, craft they they were witnessing as well. Now with the aircraft or with the UFOs rather that were spotted near Tucson. Where they were spotted, how close would they have been to Davis Month and Air Force Base where you were? Um, they were south of uh, Tucson, which the base is south. Just the base is directly south of Tucson. I don't know if you, if you folks know about anything to do with Davis Month, and there is a huge aircraft graveyard out there, too. Um, they call it the Boneyard, and there's just all kinds of old military aircraft out there and even uh, some civilian aircraft because they, they like to keep them there because there's no uh, moisture and the metal lasts longer. It doesn't rust out, and they can, you know, kind of uh, take piece, parts and pieces off of those planes and reutilize them if they need to uh, for other things. And uh, where this craft was seen at was I think it was seen for 30 minutes approximately what 30 to 40 miles south of Tucson so if I recall right I you know I could be a little bit off on that but um it was definitely in radar range of the bases you know that's what you know I think that's why we were kept there so long too because these things were flying you know you got Luke Air Force Base right there in Phoenix and then you got Davis Monson right there in Tucson and the crafts were like right there. I mean, there you've got a major airport in Phoenix and in Tucson. And there's if you've ever been to Phoenix, you can watch the airplanes come in one right after another, you know, and see them coming for a long way away. So, and they usually, where I've seen them out there, they come from an easterly direction, landing from the east to the west most of the time. And you can see them coming right over the mountains and landing. And this craft was moving north to south and a lot slower with no noise. So. Um, yeah, I mean, the the craft down in Tucson was seen by numerous people, too, on the outskirts of Tucson, and then way down south, it gets real, south of Tucson, it gets really, really um, rural. There's no, there's only a few houses, and there's some um, Native American areas out through there, and, and there was a lot of reports coming from there uh, later on in the evening. I'm just wondering if maybe they didn't let you out of the building because maybe one of those crafts were actually coming very close to the Air Force Base and they wanted to not have anybody witness it. 
It's possible. I mean, it was certainly too close for comfort. I mean, you know, when you're talking nautical miles, 30, 30, 40 miles out, that's nothing, you know. I mean, that's really nothing. That's, that's you know, they're flying over restricted airspace and everything else. So, you know, that and that's another thing, you know, why would uh, any of our craft fly that particular direction and, any, and anything else? It just doesn't make, none of it makes any sense to me whatsoever. It's still amazing to me that this story has been dropped, not only by the media, but 20 years later, there's not a lot of people talking about it anymore. Yet we still talk about Roswell. We still talk about other events. Shag Harbor up in in eastern Canada and Halifax, Nova Scotia. We talk about Rendlesham. We talk about the Travis Walton incident. We talk about other crash sites. Area 51. Why do you think the Phoenix Lights have been passed over after 20 years? That That's a great question, uh, Dave. I don't know, man. I mean... With as many people that reported seeing these crap and, and all the things that happened, I mean, it's just mind-boggling how it can just be swept under the rug like it is. You know, it's just like there's just no one's going to talk about it no more. I mean, what happened here? You know, something definitely happened. Too many people saw it, and it's just it's a major cover-up in my point of view. Mm-hmm. And I want answers. <laughs> I want some answers, man. Now, granted, there's a lot of people who have died, a lot of people who have moved, a lot of people still in the Phoenix-Tucson area who who were witnesses to that sighting. Why do you think there hasn't been such a decree for people getting answers? Why do you think, then, that even when Governor Symington came back out and said, yes, I did witness it, I feel like an idiot for putting on that press conference... Why do you think that hasn't made major news? It just doesn't make any sense, does it? I mean, it really doesn't. Um, and we, he came out, said it, and then I mean, there again, it just was slowly, quietly went away again. So I don't, you know, what's going on here? Are the powers that be, you know, telling reporters, telling people, you're not going to talk about this? It's a matter. Is it a matter of national security? What is it? Why is it being swept under the rug? It doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm just trying to figure this out. Because you think, even when Symington came back, not to get into the whole Fife Symington story again, but even when he came back out and said, I was a witness to this, you would think that would have been the door or the key to the door to reopen any type of investigation. And yet, yeah, absolutely. And yet the ball is dropped. Yeah. I mean, it, it's mind-blowing, isn't it? I mean, it's like, what the hell? You know, you got the, you got a former governor coming out saying, I saw this. I screwed up by doing the funny news conference, whatever. You would think it would have just blown up again in, on national news. But yet, it's not, it's not. It's just slowly, you know, swept under the rug yet again. I don't it makes it. you wonder. It makes you wonder if, if people are being threatened behind doors, or you know, behind closed doors. Uh, what's going on here? You know, is is there some conspiracy? Is there a cover up? I don't know. There's something going on. You know, it's just it doesn't make any sense. So as you have pieced this puzzle together over the last twenty years, Dave, I'd like you to describe, start to finish, what you think happened. Well, I think what happened was there was some unknown craft in the sky and the military reacted and was ready for whatever. And then there was a, a mass cover up, you know, um, it was swept under the rug. Too many people saw it. Too many people described the same type of craft, um, from different areas of the cities of both Phoenix and Tucson. Um, and it was simply swept away. Like nothing happened. It was just, you know, the same old type of conspiracy cover-up deal, you know, oh, it was flares, it was this, it was that, you know, 
And it was a cover-up in my point of view. I mean, without a doubt, to me, without a doubt, there's a massive cover-up. Um, something major happened that day, that night. And, and it, I think it's, I think there's other things that are still going on there that are being covered up as well, you know, as um, far as sightings go of, uh, of UFOs and whatnot. And not just in Arizona, but other parts of the country and even the world, too. I think there's a worldwide government conspiracy to some extent that um, are covering these things up. I find it still quite strange because just down the road or next door you have Roswell just north of you you have area 51 I mean here we have the trifecta of UFOs and technology yep do you think the media has a big role to play in this Oh, yeah, I think uh, in, in a lot of instances, the media is puppets of the government to some extent. Um, and, okay, you know, if you put it in the context of, okay, yeah, the government knows there's alien beings on, uh, interacting with us and they don't want anyone to know, you know, because of whatever reason, because of technology, or even if some of the conspiracy things say that there's a, a deal between the U.S. government and and alien races that, you know, was made way back when. Um, Yeah, I would say there was no limits to them actually off, you know, taking people out that were willing to talk about it, what what they witnessed and what happened to them. You know, um, I I would put no limits on it. I would say there's definitely uh, something going on, and, you know, I think the, the... People all over the world would have the right to know about it, you know. Our beautiful listener, Claudia, has a question for you. And she is saying, David, have have you become a sky watcher since the Phoenix Lights? If so, have you seen other UFOs? Um, Yeah, I actually was a sky watcher before the incident, believe it or not. And I have seen several things in the sky over my time that I cannot explain. I actually have one report to move on that happened to me here in West Virginia back in 2014. Uh, that was a pretty intense uh, experience I had. Um, so, yeah, I have several uh, uh, several things I've seen in the sky that uh, I know it's nothing we have in our arsenal. Do you believe, then, that there is some sort of secret technology that is being hidden either at Dulce, either at Dugway, either at Area 51, that could have resembled what was seen that night? Because let's face it, the one thing the United States government, when it comes to its military, is very good at is not releasing what's out there until they are close to retiring something. They did it with yeah, the F one. They did it with the F one seventeen. They did it with the SR seventy one for a long time. They did it with the U two. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely, Dave. This that's one thing I I've talked about at length with friends of mine. Um, if you go back in history, okay, we literally went from prop airplanes to the SR seventy one overnight, and that was after the Roswell incident. Um, I'm not saying that's what happened, that we got some sort of alien technology, but if you look at it, right after the Roswell, our technology really advanced within a 100 years ahead of its time because we literally went from prop airplanes to the SR-71 um, that is probably still the highest, fastest flying plane known. Now, that's a known aircraft. Who knows what we have out there now, just like you said, um, the, the government is very good at hiding stuff. And if you look at the F-117, that, that fighter was, I mean, being developed in the 60s and 70s, you know. So um, it's hard to tell what we do have out there now, you know. And where did that technology come from? Is it ours or did it come from another otherworldly place? I hear you. I hear you. Here's the interesting fact that I come with. And the one thing... That being an old sports reporter that I was, 
You learn numbers a little bit. You learn patterns a little bit. Travis Walton's incident at Snowflake, Arizona happened in 1977. Phoenix Lights happened in 1997, 20 years apart. We're now 20 years apart from the Phoenix Lights incident. What the hell could really happen in 2017 (laughs) down there? That's the major question that I want to know. Yeah, if you live in Arizona, I highly recommend you go out and sky watch this whole year <laughs> and see if you get lucky. No, exactly. Because <laughs> there may be another event. If, if it holds true, I mean, this is, like you said, the 20th year, maybe some major event's going to happen again down there. You know, I would honestly be wowed if something happened this year down in the Arizona area, you know, to kind of celebrate that 20-year anniversary to see if it does happen again. That that would absolutely, I, I, I really believe that would make, you know, extreme headlines, not only in Arizona, but ufologists everywhere would be going crazy. And you imagine 20 years from now, they'd all be waiting every day, you know, trying to figure out what's going to happen around the state of Arizona again if it happens a third time. I mean, goodness. Oh, yeah. That would be something to see, and, you know, if you put a pattern like that together, hmm, what is what is it about every 20 years? You know, that's that's a very interesting point, and uh, I like your way of thinking on that. <laughs> Do you happen to know if these UFOs were caught on any radar? I wish I had that information, you know, um, like I said, you know, that, that stuff would have been kept highly secret, uh, even if they did capture it on radar, which I'm sure they did, <laughs> because they scrambled jets, you know what I mean? So um, Luke scrambled them, Davis Monson scrambled them, you know, I'm sure it was seen on radar. If it was, you know, if it was that low and people were seeing it with their naked eyes, I mean, you know, come on, man, it's it's there. It's right in the city limits. I mean, come on. <laughs> I'm sure all the smaller airports, you know, I, I I can only venture to guess that I'm sure the military was, you know, people were being making phone calls saying, you know, that you're not, that's a vital national security or not to report that to anyone, you know. They can shut it down, you know, they can shut you down. If they, if they really want to, they'll they'll shut you down and there's nothing you can do about it. What would need to come out in order to prove this was real, in your opinion? Well, I mean, it would, to me, it would, I mean, to those people that witnessed it and recorded it, it was real. And they did, you know, that's, that's real enough to me because there's so many reports and so many people that have seen it that, it, you know, they saw something. I mean, that many people, there's not that many quacks out there that will all report the same thing. It's just the numbers are against it, you know. I mean, and you're talking, like I said, you're talking um, police officers, lawyers, doctors. You know, these folks are not just going to come out and all say they saw a UFO in the sky. What do they have to gain from that other than ridicule and, you know, whatnot? So, um other than the you know somebody really high up in the government saying yeah look we covered that up you know because of this that or this I mean that's really the only thing we could ever hope for is to say okay we're going to give you guys full disclosure this incident was real this one wasn't this one was real this one wasn't whatever the case may be you know and you know if you go back to some of the reports um, in the CIA programs and whatnot they talk about. Uh, the misinformation that was put out to keep the the secret aircraft that we were building, you know, quiet. Um, They would put out these misleading uh, news articles talking about, you know, UFOs and whatnot to keep those, to keep those aircraft that were being developed secret. So, you know, this, this was not that case, you know, too many people saw this. So I just don't see it being as that. Was this the incident that really, really solidified for you that we are being visited by aliens from another planet or another realm? I I think it's 
it definitely was a, a huge motivator. I've seen some things in the sky as a, young, as a younger man that I couldn't explain, but, you know, you kind of second-guess yourself, and you say, well, you know, maybe I was just, you know, seeing something that I thought I was mistaken or whatever, but when I was there and I was in the U.S. Air Force and I saw what happened and then days later and months later, all these reports were coming out from all these different people and you kind of put two and two together, you're just like, wow, something major happened there and, you know, there's something way more to this. And it had to be being controlled by something intelligent. It wasn't, you know, even if it was a, even if it was, it was a drone, something had to be controlling that thing, you know? So, um, yeah, you know, it's either some super high technology that we're not made aware yet or it's, some kind of uh, alien craft, in my opinion. And if it was our craft, why would the government be scrambling that many airplanes? It just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense, you know. Mm -hmm. We only got about three and a half minutes here until we got to take our break at the top of the hour. In your estimation, for as much video footage as there is, because there is more footage than just the video from the mountain. That's just the most popular one. Yeah. What do you think has to be done in order to investigate this better from a researcher's point of view? What do we need to look at? What do you think we are missing? Um, I would like, you know, I'd like to see maybe some of those tapes analyzed even better with some of the new modern technology. Um, some of the new technology they have out now for uh, video is amazing. Um, up in Massachusetts at the University of uh, Massachusetts, um, I actually had some pictures I took on a paranormal investigation analyzed up there. They have a million-dollar machine that's used in many, many court cases for photographic and video evidence in murder trials and whatnot. And you know, maybe we could get some of this video analyzed by some of the new and latest, greatest equipment out there and maybe get a better, you know, maybe they can do something and enhance the video to make it clearer and to really get a good look, maybe a better look um, at what was captured on film that day. You know, I'd like to see maybe some of that done as a researcher and uh, try to maybe clarify the images up some and, and whatnot, see if we can get a better look at them maybe. Do you think the Phoenix Lights holds a bad or a negative precedence that if a situation happened like that again where we have major boomerang-shaped UFOs over another United States city that it would be swept under the rug? I mean, let's, let's remember, with the amount of social media and people involved in social media, Facebook Live, whatever it may be, at this time, do you think that if it happened again, that it could be swept under the rug the way the Phoenix Lights have been? No, I don't. I think now with technology getting better every day, I think it would just almost be impossible uh, for it to be uh, concealed like the Phoenix Lights were. Like you said, you know, the Internet was still in its infancy, you know, and um, nowadays it would be virtually, if there was another you know, something like that was spotted over a major metropolitan area like it, like that. I mean, it would almost be virtually impossible to cover that up. Other than, you know, out and outright lies, saying, oh, you didn't see that, you saw flares. That's, that's basically what they've done for the Phoenix Lights. They're telling people, no, you didn't see what you think you saw, you saw flares. I mean, they're trying to actually tell you that you didn't see what you saw, you know. It's like mind over matter trick in the old school, you know, you didn't see that. That's not what you saw, but yet hundreds and hundreds of people saw these things. I find that very interesting indeed. I mean, the cover-ups when it comes to topics like this are absolutely phenomenal. And we're going to switch gears in hour number three. We're going to talk to David a little bit more about his paranormal investigations in West Virginia. 
And if you have any questions about the Phoenix Lights, I'll ask them for Dave, and we'll get to those questions as well. You're listening to Space Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott. we got two hours down, one hour to go as we are going the distance with David Spinks tonight. We'll be right back after this. I'm going to go see if the Northern Lights are still dancing. Maybe I could get a better picture as well. We'll be back. The SOR Sightlines is a place for you to find answers to your strange experiences. Hi there, this is Mike Schmidt. If you have had an encounter with ghosts, UFOs, Bigfoot, ETs, or anything else that doesn't make sense, head to spacedoutradio.com and file a Sightlines report. All information you give is 100% confidential, and I will personally help you find the answers you need. SOR Sightlines, your answers are a click away. Have you got your Cosmic Passport? If you need one, tune in to Cosmic Passport on Spaced Out Weekend. This is Elizabeth Anglin, ET experiencer, spirit medium, and host of Cosmic Passport. Each weekend, I'll be bringing you interviews and support from other paranormal experiencers and the best in intuitive spiritual guidance from across the globe. It's all happening starting at 9 p.m. Pacific Time, midnight Eastern, on spacedoutradio.com. Hi there. I'm Butch Witkowski, lead investigator with the Four Cop. On the final Monday of every month, you can listen to me and host Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio's Strange Days. We're going to get to the heart of the matter when it comes to what's happening out there. People are seeing and experiencing things from ET contact to Bigfoot, and I want to hear about it. Your experiences are what we investigators need to help solve these unknown mysteries. So tune in at spacedoutradio.com to the final Monday of every month from Butch Witkowski's Strange Days. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit, and expect a miracle. This is your medium, Joanna, from Spaced Out Weekend, Two Mediums and a Large. I would love it if you would come and join us with host James Tyson every other Sunday on Spaced Out Weekend. Together, we will take your calls and your questions live. Our goal is to provide you with a positive outlook on deep questions that you may have. Questions regarding love, relationships, money, or whatever else is on your mind. Come and check us out at spacedoutradio.com. This is Eric Markham, news editor for Spaced Out Radio's The Encounter Online. We have put together a great team of writers and journalists from all over the world to bring you top quality paranormal stories from alien encounters to the latest conspiracies. You won't find any of that fake news here. True stories and top notch reporting as we look to bring these experiences to the mainstream. The encounter online only at spacedoutradio.com. Patrolling the Pacific Northwest, we are always on the lookout for the strange and unassuming stories that real people are experiencing. Hi, I'm Vincent Zunza from Pacific North Weird. Me and Alexandra Sullivan have teamed to bring to you those odd stories that never seem to make it into the mainstream. Stories so weird that we'll leave you scratching your head wondering, is this real? It's as real as it gets with Pacific North Weird. You can watch our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. Become more intimate and interactive with Spaced Out Radio. Join our Space Travelers Club with your new membership. For $5 a month, we'll provide you with special access to the website, monthly prize draws from books to psychic readings, along with monthly newsletter, private interviews, and more. Sign up today to be part of Spaced Out Radio's experience. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Don't have time to listen to Spaced Out Radio Live? Wherever you are, the car, the office, the shower, or even if you're traveling, we're right here for you. Each Spaced Out Radio show can be found on iTunes, 
tune in and on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. It's the perfect way for you to catch up on our shows. For more information, just head over to our website, spacedoutradio.com, and tune in to us today. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Strange creatures lurking in the night, the sounds of wood knocking in the forest, odd happenings right out of a fictional world. These are the reports I love. Hi there, this is author Ronald Murphy, and I would love it if you'd join me and Spaced Out Radio host Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month on our journey into the unknown land of cryptozoology at spacedoutradio.com. From Mothman to Frogman and everything in between, hey, they don't call me the crypto guru for nothing. Did you know that Spaced Out Radio runs seven days a week? Hi, it's James Tyson from Spaced Out Weekend. Every Saturday and Sunday night, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, you can join me and my guests for some great chatter about what's going on out in the universe or even in that dark part of the basement you really don't want to go back into. Well, let's find the answers to your experiences together. So come on up to Uncle Jimbo's cabin on the weekend. For more information, look us up at spacedoutradio.com. The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio. Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and hashtag Spaced Out Radio. And on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Now, back to the program. A child grew up too fast, went running wild. Now we don't know who to pray to anymore. Welcome back to the final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Good to have you with us. Went to check on the Northern Lights. And they're gone. They've danced their way out of the sky over Uncle Jimbo's cabin. Well, at least we got to see them tonight. That is the main thing. That's why I love living in northern British Columbia. Canada. West Coast. Northern Hemisphere. Because you get to see things like that. It was absolutely beautiful. I wish you could have been there with me. Checking it out. Anyhow. Tomorrow night and Sunday, Uncle Jimbo James Tyson and Elizabeth Anglin are back for Spaced Out Weekend. That gets going at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern Time. I will be disappearing after this show. I got my backpack packed. I'm going out into the wilderness to find my zen, my chi, and maybe some more of those northern lights. But don't worry, we got you taken care of for the weekend, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern Time at spacedoutradio.com. If you want to follow us on social media, you can do so on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Use the hashtag Spaced Out Radio if you want to chat with me during the show as well. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. You can tune us in on TuneIn, download this show and others on iTunes. And we're on TalkStream Live, RadioGuide.fm, and Stitcher. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including joining the SOR Space Travelers Club for 5 bucks a month. You can also head on over to patreon.com. For a dollar a month, you can become a patron of Spaced Out Radios as well. We welcome in WQEE 99 Rock the Key down at noon in Georgia as we are your nighttime entertainment. We're also live on 107.7 FM in New Orleans and over 160 countries around the world. Good to have you with us. We're live on KTLK, the Fringe FM, in Las Vegas on Renegade Talk Radio. And if you're listening in on Revolution Radio... Remember, the Double R Machine is a donation station financed by you, the valued listener. Head on over to freedomslips.com and donate today. Bill Cardwell has set a near-impossible password for tonight if you're in the SOR Space Travelers Club. pseudo pseudo hypoparathyroidism. 
Pseudo pseudo hypoparathyroidism is your password. If you say it slowly, it's not that hard. So, Bill sets a password each and every night right here on the mighty SOR. Use it wisely, space travelers. We would appreciate that. We don't want you to get hurt. Now, tonight we're talking the Phoenix Lights the first couple of hours. I see some questions from our audience building up for David Spinks, our guest. We're also going to get into some paranormal theories this hour as well. David, welcome back. Hey, glad to be back, man. (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. And you know what? I can honestly say I was a little disappointed. I ran outside, made sure everything was on mute, ran outside, stare up at the skies, and the northern lights were gone. They danced out of here. A little hurt over that. There you go. Exactly. I, and I'm blaming you for that, Dave, because we had a good topic. We did. That's right. We're talking UFOs, man. Come on. Well, we got to do that every now and again. <clears throat> you know, because that's kind of what we do on this show. But I do have a couple questions from our audience. This one comes from Everett in our Space Out Radio chat room. He is asking, Dave, when the military claims that a UFO event is flares, balloons, or other man-made material, why do they never recreate the exercise to prove their point, in your opinion? <laughs> That's an excellent question. Uh, why would they? Uh, they won't do it because if they do it and it doesn't match up, then that makes them obviously look like they're lying. So, you know, they don't have to. They're the military. They just tell you like it is, and that's it. Does that bother you as a researcher? Oh, absolutely. I mean, they're not going to go out of their way, you know, and then plus if they're putting out misinformation, they're not going to go and recreate the and take the risk of, you know, number one, spending the money. Number two, take the risk of making themselves look stupid. Let's get to another it's, point. It, you know, go ahead, please. It, it points to a massive cover up all around when they don't do things like that. You know, I mean, if they were truly trying to disprove, you know, tell everyone and show everyone that there's no uh, UFO activity, then they would be doing stuff like that, in my opinion. And they just don't. They're not going to do that. Let's get to another question here. This one comes from Michael in the SOR Space Travelers Club. He's asking, David, what do you think the most solid and revealing evidence there is for the craft to be from some other planet? Mm. Well, um, personally speaking, I, you know, I'll, I'll go back to one of the sightings I had, you know, when you see, I saw a craft here in West Virginia. I'll tell you this story real quick. That's okay, Dave. Um, I was, I, I often sit out in my yard at night cause I live in the mountains in a very rural area. I'm surrounded by millions of acres of woods. Um, I live on top of a mountain. And I can see quite a long way uh, from horizon to horizon. Well, one night I was sitting out, uh, had a little fire going in my yard because, you know, I can do that. And I love doing that, and especially in the summer. And I stood up to stretch, and I turned around, and I saw a oval-shaped craft coming from the, um, the northwest. And let me tell you something, this thing was trucking. And me being in the military and around the military most of my uh, young adult life, this thing was probably moving at 15,000 miles an hour, as much ground it was it was covering in, in the time frame it was covering. There was no uh, red, white, and uh, green lights flashing on it like all aircraft are required to have. And it was not it was not making a sound whatsoever, and it was heading right over my head. I had my truck about... I don't know, 10 yards away, and I sprayed for my truck to get my 1,000-power binoculars out. And the woman I was with at the time, as I was grabbing my binoculars, she said, oh, my God, it just made a 45-degree turn. Now, something moving that fast, not making a sound, and makes a turn like that, if there was a human or any type of <laughs> a human inside of that, it would have killed, killed you. Uh, we don't have anything that can withstand G-forces like that. By the time I grabbed my binoculars out of the truck to get a look at this thing, it, it had stopped directly over our heads, probably, I would say, two to 5,000 feet. 
and was just hovering there. And in the sky, it looked like the size of um, a little, maybe a little bigger than a paper plate. But, you know, being that high up, it's obviously bigger than that. Well, I got, I swung around, got my binoculars on it for just about a second or two, and that thing shot straight up into space and disappeared without making a single sound. Now, that would have definitely broke the sound barrier and should have made a sonic boom, and it never did. And as far as I know, not saying I know everything uh, that's in our arsenal, but we don't have anything like that that can do that. Um, and, you know, seeing something like that just lets me know and, and I it puts it in my head 100% that there's something else out there. You know, there's other intelligent beings that are controlling craft. Uh, whether they're flying them or controlling them remotely, who knows, but, you know, that thing should have broke the sound barrier and made a really loud sonic boom, and it didn't. Neither time when it was moving towards us or when it shot straight up into space and disappeared. So, you know, there you go. I have a question from Milo for you. He says, David, you have had multiple sightings. Do you think then that you have been taken or experienced any missing time? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I'm not going to go into that on tonight, but uh, I'll be coming out with more information on that stuff later. Um, I'm not tonight's not the night for it, but I'm doing some things to. I'm possibly going to be doing some regressions and stuff like that. So I want to get more information before I come out and talk about it. Mm-hmm. Well, now I have to press. <laughs> you, you just put you just put me on the spot, man. I wouldn't be doing my job if it did. You know, I, I understand you don't want to get into detail. You are an experiencer, though, according to your own experiences. Yeah. O often? Um, no, I've had several experiences over my years. Um my dear old mom, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you this story, too, real quick, since it was brought up. Um, me and my mom and my little brother were traveling uh, to see my aunt in Arkansas from New Mexico. And we were somewhere in northern Texas. I don't remember exactly where. I think I was around 12 years old. And it was one of those days where, you know, you're in tornado alley and the storms that were coming through were just unreal. The sky was black and green. And somehow my mom got off on this two lane country road. We got off the interstate somehow for some reason. I don't know why. And we had an old Malibu 350 <laughs> and uh, with a 350 in it. And we ended up on this two lane country road for like 10 miles. And mom's like, how did I, you know, how did we get here? Why are, you know, I, I got to get back on the interstate. Well, lo and behold, there was cows on both sides of the road, you know, bob wire fence and whatnot. And there was a, um, an old type windmill out in this field and the clouds just opened up and a bright red beam of light came down through the clouds. And all I remember was my mom slamming on the brakes and she said, what the F is that? And next thing you know, we were turned around going back in the other direction and an hour had passed. And that's all I really remember about that. So um, I think I've had some weird things go on in my life. I don't know, you know, what, but, you know, I'm looking more into that. And, and there's a lot of other people that talk of this, that they have multiple experiences over their life. So I'm kind of doing some research on myself, if that makes sense. Let's shift on over to the paranormal. But before we do, yeah. I just want to make sure I have no more questions from our audience. By the way, Joni Mitchell says, hello, my friend David Spinks. How are you? I'm supposed to Oh, hey, Joni. Uh, I know there's a few of my friends listening tonight that watch me and David Weatherly and Sean Austin and stuff. So if I, thank you guys for coming over and listening tonight. And Tripp is wondering... When do you plan on doing some regression therapy on this? And do you think you've been implanted? I, I wouldn't go that far. I don't know. You know, um, I'm planning on, I have a certain person in mind that I'm going to be maybe doing this with. And, 
hopefully she'll do that with me. She's really good from what I understand. So I'm going to record it all, and if anything significant comes out, I'll probably put it out there. You know, what what the hell? <laughs> all right, let's get into some paranormal here. When did you start yeah, becoming sure. a paranormal investigator? Well, um, back in when I was 15, I had an experience with whoa, my mom's grandfather. Um, my mom's grandfather was a World War II veteran. He smoked like a freight train, and he had a quarter of one lung left. Um, he got pneumonia and, in the military and got really, really sick, and they cut out, like, all of his lung, but one quarter of one lung left, and he kept on smoking. He had a trach and everything, you know, and he smoked through his little freaking hole <laughs> in his neck, and he just didn't care. You know, he's like, I'm going to smoke. I like smoking, and I don't care. And, you know, we knew it was just a matter of time before he was going to die. And and when I was 15, of course, he, he died. But the story that really uh, got me into researching more about what happens to us when I die. Um, this one particular night I was at my father's house as, you know, with visiting him here in West Virginia and my grandfather that I'm talking about lived 30 miles up the road. Well, in the middle of the night, I sat straight up in the bed and there's my mom's dad standing at the foot of the bed as clear as a bell, solid looking at me. And I'm like, what are you doing here? Papa? Cause there's no reason he should have been at my dad's house, you know, in the middle of the night. And he didn't say anything to me. He just smiled. And he disappeared right in front of my face. And I said, man, that was a crazy dream. And I went back to sleep, you know. Well, the next day, I was, you know, that was stuck in my mind. And I said, I'm going to call up to Grandma and Grandpa and see how he's doing. And when I called up there, my uncle from out of state answered the phone. And I said, what are you doing there? And he said, Dave, no one called you yet? And I said, no, what are you talking about? He said, Grandpa died last night. And everybody's coming in to uh, see it, you know, coming in for the funeral. I'm like, holy crap, I just dropped the phone, and I didn't say anything about this dream. So we had the funeral and everything, and about, I think it was like four or four or five months later, ever the whole family came back up to Grandma's, um, you know, and we all were hanging out, having dinner and everything, and I just came out and told everybody in the family, I said, hey, tonight Grandpa died, I had this crazy dream, and this is what happened, and several, almost all of their faces went funny, except for a couple, and they all reported having the same exact experience I did. And I knew right then and there that he had come to say goodbye to all of us before he went wherever he was going. So that just jump started me like hardcore into trying to find some answers. You know, I look at all this as little pieces to the puzzle of a grander scheme, if you will. And I, you know, if I can find one little piece of the puzzle, then so be it. If I don't, I don't care. I This is my passion. This is what I enjoy doing, and I'm going to keep on doing it as long as I can. You know, and that's what really started me off into the realm of the paranormal and supernatural, if you will. Mm-hmm. It's amazing how there's always that one experience that just kind of rocks you with it. For me, it was seeing a little girl about a foot and a half away from me. Couldn't have been more than two, three years old. At first, when I saw her, I thought it was my daughter until I realized that my daughter was laying right beside me on the couch, sleeping away on my arm. And you have that type of close encounter. It really sets you off on a path to try and figure out what's going on, doesn't it? Yeah, it changes you. You you know, it's like this light bulb goes off in your head. And, you know, me and David Weatherly often talk about this stuff, you know, almost everybody you know, if you really sit back and you talk to people and you, they all have a ghost story of some sort. Either someone close to them has seen something that they can't explain or they themselves have seen something. And, you know, there's, it's just one of those, one of man's greatest questions, you know, what happens to us when we die? Does our energy just transform and go on? to something else or become some kind of higher consciousness or are we just dead and that's it? And then you talk to all these people who've had these experiences. It just blows you away that you know that there's got to be something else out there. What is it? So what do you believe is on the other side then? 
Well, I'm not sure. You know, I grew up. Uh, my 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 dad's dad is a was a very hardcore. He was also a World War II vet. He came back from the war changed. You know, he he was a medic. He st- he was in the second wave of Normandy, um, and you know he was he came back a changed man, and he became a a really firing brimstone Baptist minister. So I was kind of brought up in that area, you know. Um, there's no if, ands, or buts. You know, you're going to you're going to heaven or hell, or and, and that's that's it. But I was always of the mindset of no, you know, I don't think it's all black and white like that. I think there's something else, and I don't know for sure yet. I'm on the fence with everything. I know there's good and bad in the world, and I know there's definitely evil people in the world. You know, I've seen it firsthand. Um, I've looked into people's eyes that, you know, there's not a human being there. Um, they're, they're controlled by something else, if you will, or possessed by something. Um, you know, and I'm searching for those one, you know, if I can get one little piece of that puzzle, I'll, I'll be happy. Um, and it helps me decide what I, what my belief system is going to be better than so be it. You know, it's, it's my own personal um, search, if you will, you know, I don't dis, uh, disrespect anyone on their personal beliefs and we all have our own and it is what it is. You know, I'm, I'm just in my own personal search for answers. There's a lot of different, uh, or differing opinions on how investigations, David, should take place. I've been very vocal on it on this show in regards to what I think is right and what is wrong. I think we have a lot of brilliant people in this field who are doing some very, very impressive studying and research on this. But we don't seem any closer to finding the inevitable answer, is there life after death? Why do you think it's that way? Well, I'm still on the fence on that question. That's an excellent question. You know, um, you can go to the to some of the theories that are we supposed to know are we going to be allowed to know you know is there some ultimate force that keeps us from knowing this um who knows you know um it's it's just one of those conundrums you know that you just wonder why can't we maybe get a little one step closer i mean so many people are trying to investigate and research that exact question and why aren't we getting any closer? I don't know. You know, I don't know. It's just, uh, it's frustrating at times, but at the same time, when you go to these locations or you go to someone's house, who's having all these experiences and you, you document something that is just insane and you know, it's, it's not explainable by science or you have an experience, you know, uh, that you can't explain, um, it just keeps you motivated and keeps you going. And, you know, that's just what I do and what we do, uh, me and Weatherly and and Austin, you know, we, we keep going on because there's times when we don't get anything that's really, we can really say definitively is paranormal, but there's other times that we've had some stuff happen that just will simply blow your mind. And, it's unexplainable uh, at this point in scientific terms, you know, at this point that we, there's no way we can actually explain it. Um, maybe technology will come in the future that will help us be able to more, be able to scientifically document this stuff and recreate it somehow. Maybe not. Maybe so. We don't know. But we got to keep on striving and keep on going to see what we can get. Do you think that the answer is actually out there, or do you think it's something that we're not supposed to know? I don't know, man. I mean, it's really tough. It's a tough situation. Um, at times, I think there's some maybe, you know, I think we have made some progress in ways, um, you know, with cam- with better cameras and better recorders and, and maybe some other types of equipment. Um that does make let us make baby steps, you know, and saying, yeah, you know, you're able to document things a little bit better. But I, don't, I just don't know, man. I, you know, it's just one of those things that we're going to keep trying to go forward with. And hopefully as a community, you know, maybe we can come up with some set standards somehow at some point and try to come together and document them all the same way. Maybe that will further, you know. You know, science as a whole, 
took baby steps for many thousands of years. And, you know, look where we're at now. We're sending spaceships out in space. So hopefully, you know, maybe maybe we're just the beginning generations of doing this, and maybe at some point they'll get some more answers. Absolutely. What do you like to investigate with? Do you like to investigate more with your own intuitive feelings? Not saying that you're psychic or anything, but... Or do you prefer the technological side and the gadgets and cameras and gears that everyone is using? I like it all, Dave, to be honest with you, because what I like to do is, you know, if you've been doing this long enough, you can walk into a place and you can feel the energy a lot of times. You can feel if it's a negative type energy or a happy energy or a sad energy. You can really, you know, the old hair on the back of your neck added, you know, you can feel the hair on the back of your neck or your arms stand up when you feel this energy around you sometimes. And then what we like to do is if, you know, we use multiple pieces of equipment, you know, and what's really cool is if you walk into a place and you get a, you get a weird sick feeling and all of a sudden you get a hit on a mel meter at the same time. And then you get an EVP at the same time, then you can kind of put those things together and say, wow, you know, we got, say Sean was feeling sick and then all of a sudden we got an EVP and this device went off at the same exact time. And then you're saying, well, you know, there was some, definitely some environmental factors going on there, you know? So you try to put all that together as a whole and then you can maybe say, well, yeah, you know, there was definitely something going on at that time. What do you like to investigate? Do you like to investigate residentials? Do you like to investigate the, older buildings, <laughs> tourism type spots. I mean, in West Virginia, you're an old country there, man. You and you, yeah, you, man. I, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, I don't know how far you are from Point Pleasant and the Silver Bridge and the, <laughs> the Mothman area, or if you oh, yeah. are, or how close you are to Ohio where anything and everything that's weird seems to come out of Ohio. Oh yeah, you got that right. Um, I, I literally live like 35, 40 minutes from Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. I live about two and a half hours from Point Pleasant. I mean, I live in, a, in the center of the Appalachian Mountains. So, you know, you're talking some of the oldest mountains in the world right here in my backyard that I live in. And I'm fortunate enough to have that at my disposal, you know. So um, I like to investigate it all, Dave. I mean, I do it all. I've done it all over the years, residentials. I've done many, many haunted locations throughout the country and West Virginia, of course, my home state. Um, you know, because it's all, you know, it's all relevant to each other, whether it's a, someone's house or, you know, a location where, say, like, take Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum, where, where thousands of people died over the years and were in some of the most inhumane conditions ever. You know, you, you kind of try to document those things and see, well, we had all this going on in this place. What's the difference between this place and this house? Um, I kind of stay away from the residentials anymore because, honestly, I've ran into a lot of uh, people now with all the television shows. They want to be famous and they're, you know, they've made up stories and they, you know, I try to run them through basically a police background check and I'll, run them through a whole questionnaire two or three times and ask the same questions in different manners, trying to catch them up in a lot. It's just a lot of liability involved with it now with the residentials. You know, I still try to help people, of course, if I think they're legitimate and they really got a problem, you know, I'll go in try to document some of their claims. And then, you know, I turn it over to clergy that I'm friends with that can go in and do that type of thing, cleanse their house and their location. And even them, if they need it, Being that your area is in such a haunted, haunted and strange area, that that western Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia area, does anything really surprise you, whatever stories come out of that area anymore? No, you'd be surprised. That, you know, I get emails and calls from people all the time saying they've seen this or they, you know, they've seen this creature in their yard or they've seen something in the sky or, you know, just so many tales, you know, and then you've got to remember, you know, around here is primarily a lot of um, Irish, Scotch, Irish and Irish and German folks that came over from Europe back in the day and they brought their folklore and their tales and their practices with them. And, you know, some of these hollow hollows that are here in the state are so 
deep down, you know, for many, many years, outside people couldn't get in here. So those, those roots are steep, deep in this country with people. And they brought a lot of that stuff, their beliefs with, from Europe with them. And, um, it's carried on till today. You do a lot of work with David Weatherly, who will be a guest on this show on Tuesday. Yeah. Also, give us a couple of examples of some strange and weird stories or hauntings that you have investigated. You mean me and David? You in general, or you and David, no, whatever, whatever no. works. Uh, I'll tell you a crazy, a crazy instance. Uh, we went to this location, uh, me and Weatherly, up in Indiana called uh, the Rhodes Hotel. And this place was... Back in the day, it was a notorious brothel, and a lot of the old mobsters and gangsters used to hang out there because it was fairly close to Chicago. And, you know, word of mouth came to me, and we ended up going up there, and we stayed for a week in this place. And, I mean, from the moment we walked in the door, it was just off the chain. Um, the, lady, the, the owner, Gail, was a really nice lady, she left us the key hidden in a, in a particular spot and we went in there and it was for a charity event one of the nights so we went in there the first night by ourselves and the next night was going to be a charity paranormal event you know we were going to give a you know we were going to speak and people bought tickets and whatnot so as soon as we walked in the door we know more than set down some of our stuff on the table and we sat down for a minute and we heard footsteps coming from upstairs and then they went down the stairs, and then we heard the front door open. And we're thinking, well, somebody's here, you know. So we jump up and run over there, and the front door stand wide open. This is in the middle of winter. It's cold as all get out up there, snow on the ground. And we look around. There's no foot tracks going from the porch out in the snow. There's nobody out there. We run upstairs. There's nobody there. And we hear what sounds like a bunch of women talking, like, but we can't make out what they're saying. So we're like, oh, this is going to be interesting. You know, this is a, we just walked in the door and we're already having these experiences. So the next night we have the event. Everything's great. You know, there's like 40 people or 25, 30, 40 people in there. And we give our speech and everything and they leave. And then we decide we're going to investigate with some of the other speakers that came and guests. And we're, me and David were upstairs in the brothel area where all the rooms are and we're doing a David's running an EV or a ghost box session in this main bathroom. It's a pretty good sized bathroom. And I'm, I have the camera on him and I'm outside in the hallway filming it. Well, I walk in there to take another piece of equipment and I go to set it down and I felt this wave of energy hit me and I actually stumbled backwards and got really, really dizzy. And he's like in the middle of a ghost box session and he's like, what happened? What happened? I said, I don't know. I just felt this wave of energy hit me. He goes, you better sit down. You don't look good. So I kept feeling this like tickling sensation on my head. And at the same time, David's like, what'd you do to Dave? And it said, I hit him ha, 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 like that on the ghost box. And he said, what'd you hit him with? He said, a shovel. Well, and this was all live on my, on our YouTube channel, mind you. <laughs> and so he shut down the session because it was getting really negative. It was talking about it was going to attack us and all this stuff. So he shut it down. We went downstairs. There's like six, seven people down there watching our live feed. And I, I feel that tickling sensation on my head again. And I reach up and I have a big knot on my head with a cut and it's blood coming out of my head. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. And everyone was like, Oh my God, dude. And you know, something actually unseen told us on the box that it hit me in the head with a shovel and I have a big knot on my head and, and, and it's bleeding. So that was very, very unnerving to say the least that something had enough juice behind it to punch through and, and physically hurt me like that. And the very next night we were down in the bottom of the, in the main floor of this place and David's kind of pissed off and he's talking to the ghost box. Right. And he's like, you know, you like to attack people on this and that. He's kind of, he's not provoking, but he's kind of giving it down the road. You know what I mean? And all of a sudden, and it starts saying that it was going to slash him with a knife and stuff. And he says, my back, within a minute or two, he said, my back's burning really bad, man. I said, well, I said, we, we better check it, you know. 
And he has two shirts on. He has a long sleeve, like thermal shirt on with a short sleeve over top of it. This is all live on the camera. He picks his shirt up, or I pick his shirt up, and he's got these huge scratches from the back of his left shoulder all the way down to his belt line. And the thing, like, told us it was going to attack him. So two nights in a row, we were physically attacked by something unseen with no explanation as to what could have done it. We didn't do it to ourselves. You know, there's no way we could have done it. Um, and there was people around to see the first night, and then the, the second night, uh, it was all live on camera again. So when something like that happens, you know, what's that tell you? It tells you, yeah, there's stuff out there that we just don't understand that has enough force behind it that it can do physical things, you know, and it's really crazy and unnerving when that kind of stuff happens. When it gets physical, does that bother you? Does, does it affect you differently than, say, when you go into a haunting and the ghosts aren't trying to hit you, scratch you, push you, or anything along those lines? Um, I, I would just say it's very unnerving, and I, that's only happened. I've never that was the most extreme thing that's ever happened to me. Um, I've been scratched a few times, just small scratches, and I had a big red welt on my neck one time that I couldn't explain. But um, it doesn't. It, it's very unnerving when it happens to you because you realize that there's just stuff out there, you know, that can reach, punch through the veil and really affect you physically. And we often tell people this, you know, it can be dangerous because, you know, you have a lot of people that watch TV and they think, oh, you can go into a place in an hour like they see on TV and just get all this crazy stuff. It's just simply not true. That's not how it works. TV is TV. It's entertainment and it's simply entertainment, folks. You can't believe everything you see on TV. I'll just leave it at that. Um, you know, we will be in places for hours and hours, and then you'll have nothing, and then all of a sudden there's just this flurry of crazy activity that happens for three to five, ten minutes, whatever, and then it's just totally dead again. You just never know what you're going to get when you're doing this. It doesn't. It 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 affects me negatively somewhat when I get it when I've been attacked by something or scratched, but it doesn't. It doesn't stop me from doing what I'm doing. I, I, I still strive forward, and so does David, and so does Sean. Um, it just reiterates that we know there's something else out there, and we're trying to document it and and show folks it's, it's really there. Mm-hmm. You investigate with very professional people. Obviously, yeah. the way people talk in this industry... There are groups out there that are just trying to debunk everything. There are groups out there who are trying to figure out this whole life question like you are. And there are groups out there who are just proving haunted buildings are haunted. They're playing what I like to call Pokemon Ghost. (laughs) Yeah. What is your opinion then, as someone who works with some of the best in this field of the paranormal now compared to say what it was before all the television hype created this monster? Well, that's excellent. That's an excellent question. Um, you know, me and whether we often talk about this, I've been doing this since what, 1986, uh, as far as the paranormal ghost stuff goes. And back in those days, you really didn't talk about it in the public because you would be ridiculed, you know, and then, you know, people seem to be more on the religious side back in those days, at least in my, you know, in my small circle. I mean, if you would come and talk about that in my family, they would say, son, you know, don't mess with that. That's demons, you know, and then you would be shunned. I mean, you could be shunned out of your family and your community for doing that stuff. And, you know, nowadays it's just widely way more accepted and uh, so many people are doing it, which I, I, you know, there's very, there's a lot of differences in what weekend warrior type investigators do as I, as I call them sometimes. And, and I'm not knocking them. I think the more people we have doing it, Hey, the better for the field in general. But, you know, when you, you just, you're simply not going to go out and, you know, a lot of these groups, I, I've seen them drinking before investigations and everything else. I mean, that's not how you conduct yourself professionally. Um, you know, you want to go in professional and you want to try to 
really be open-minded but not inebriated or on anything else, you know, because then your senses and everything else is screwed up when you're doing this. So, you know, you want to go in and, and be as professional as you can and try to really document some paranormal happenings, you know, just, it's just so many different diverse things. And the whole TV thing has really brought it to light. It's like a double-edged sword, as we say, you know, it's good for the field, but it's also really, really bad for the field too. What about the continuity in investigations? There really doesn't seem to be any. No, there's not. I mean, that's what I was saying. You know, maybe at some point we can all come, uh, a lot of people can get together, maybe come up with some kind of, you know, it'd be great to have some kind of standard of investigating. I don't think it'll ever get to that point that everyone will use it because, you know, there's just no way at this time to prove without a shadow of a doubt what we're getting, what we're communicating with, you know, um, until then, I mean, it's just going to be, you know, you have so many different diverse backgrounds of people, different belief systems, and they have their own ideas of how they should investigate or, you know, um, a lot of people think you should do it a certain way. And then there's, you know, if you don't do it that way, you're doing it wrong. I mean, it's just, there's so many different diverse think methods of thinking during doing this. It's just insane. See, that's probably one of the issues I have is the lack of continuity in the way the investigations take place. You know, I realize everybody is going to have their own way, their own avenue, their own reason for what they are trying to solve. I do get that, and I can respect that. But in my opinion, why get into it if you're not trying to solve anything? I don't see the entire purpose of, you know, like this TAPS group, which I'm, I just learned about a couple nights ago once again, of trying to prove that a haunted place is haunted without offering any type of solution whatsoever. To me, that's dangerous, Not all, especially if they are doing residential homes or places of current business. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if, if someone, especially, okay, if say a family calls you up and you have a group and they're saying, hey, we need help, man. We're having all this crazy stuff going on. We're being attacked or whatever the case may be. You know, you definitely got to go in there with a mindset to try to help that family, you know, um, whether it be with clergy or whatever the case may be. You know, um, I know over my years of doing this residential-wise, I would go in to a residential and try to document some of their claims, try to witness myself some of those claims. And, you know, if I got even one of them, I would be on the phone as soon as possible and saying, Hey, you need it. Can you go over to these people's house and, you know, bless their house and try to offer some resolution as to what's going on and how to help these folks. Because, you know, it just drives me crazy. You'll see people telling their stories on whatever, if it's radio, TV, whatever. And they, they reach out for help, but you see these other people ridicule them. Well, I just moved. Well, let me tell you something. You can't just up and move. Most people can't just say I'm leaving my house, you know, my place of where I live. They can't just up and move. Uh, I don't know too many people that have the kind of money to be able to do that. You know, <laughs> um, I'm just going to leave my house and go live in a hotel for the rest of my life. I mean, you just can't, that just doesn't work for a lot of people. You've got to come in and try to help them try to, you know, get that activity to get out of there. Do you find then that in your years of paranormal investigation that most of the spirits that are angry are just that angry and not so demonic as once again television leads us to believe? Yeah, the whole demonic thing. I mean, honestly, you know, talking with the people I know who've been doing this a long time and some of the, you know, some of the most well-known people out there, demonologists and whatnot, True demonic hauntings are very few and far between, even though in recent years there seems to be a spike in that um, and in a lot of cases. But there's just, you know, the whole TV thing has just blown it so far out of proportion. And then 
you know, it's everybody thinks something. If it's a negative spirit, it's an automatically a demon. That's just simply not true. Um, my personal belief is if someone was in a butthole when they were alive and they're still hanging around, they're most likely going to be a butthole when they're dead. If they're even if they're still hanging around, you know, um, there's and there's many different theories to as why spirits may be still uh, earthbound, you know, but. That's one of the questions we're trying to solve. Why are they still here? Why does some go on and why maybe do some still stay here? You know, whether they're attached to their home or a, a, maybe a personal item or they have unfinished business, who's to say? But, you know, um, true demonic type hauntings, in my opinion, are very few and far between. What's the worst case you've ever dealt with? Mm. Well, as far as a residential, um, I got a call from this guy, or actually got an email from this guy, and he was saying he thinks his house is haunted, and, you know, and I said, okay, and I kind of ran him through the questions, what's going on, this and that, and he said that this thing's trying to make him hang himself, you know, and kill himself. And, I mean, I ran this guy through a whole gamut of questions and everything, and, uh, so I, you know, after doing it and he, and he answered the questions the right way for me to be able to say, okay, yeah, we need to go down there. So I, I took back in those days, I had my cousin investigating with me and we were both active law enforcement officers. He's still active, but I'm retired now. <clears throat> so we went down there with, um, him and we had a psychologist on the team and everything. And we get in the house, and this guy's showing us around and everything. And I'm looking around, and he starts telling his story how his wife left him and was cheating on him and everything. And he actually showed us where he tore the ceiling apart to get to the beams of the house and was going to hang himself and all this stuff. He had a rope and everything, and it was just really, I'm like, oh, my God, this dude's on the edge of killing himself. And come to find out, you know, it was all because his wife had left him. We had the psychologist talk to him and everything, and, you know, it's, you never know when you're doing this, you know, you should have, you know, and, and that was as far as it wasn't worse as far as a haunting, but it was just really hard to see this guy going through to the point. And he's got that little kids and everything, you know, and he was to the point where he's going to hang himself, but he was, he was so distraught over this that he was hearing voices in his head. He was seeing things in his house and, he said that it was making him want to hang himself. Now, whether to say that was paranormal, I don't know. It could have been. You know, there's a lot of talk of sleep paralysis and things visiting people in their dreams. And when people are at their weakest state, that that leaves you open for negative entities to come in. So, I mean, the guy actually had some rope burns on his neck because he tried to already had tried to do it a couple of times and didn't go all the way through with it. So, you know, that was one of the most bizarre and really freaky cases I've worked on. Got a I question. did uh, film. Oh, go, go ahead. I did film an actual exorcism one time, and that was really unnerving. <laughs> I'll never do that again. <laughs> I got a question from the audience here. This one comes from Ron in the SOR Space Travelers Club. He's saying, how do you protect yourselves if you and have you ever had an attachment? Um, we, uh, we David has his own way of doing it. Um, I do it with prayers and sage and um, holy water. And yes, I have had stuff follow me home before. Um, I think I had an attachment after I did a case. It wasn't a case, but it was a, a location that was a notorious haunted place up in PA. The whole town knew it was a haunted house. Um, even Ed and Lorraine Warren had visited it at one time um, back in the early 80s. Numerous deaths in this house. And it, the story went that people would move in and they'd move out right away. It was everything you look for in a true haunted location. So me and these guys that I used to work with, we went up there and we lived in this place for over a month. And just every night, I mean, it was really off the chain, different stuff happening. And after that, we went, ended up living there for a month, went back like three more times. And after that, after that investigation, I had like the worst 
year of luck in my life. I like I went through a really bad divorce. I went almost financially broke. All kinds of bad stuff happened to me. I was sick often, um, and just really crazy nightmarish dreams of something attacking me. I actually woke up with a scratch on my arm one time from a dream, and so I actually went and got cleansed um, a couple of different times by different, uh, once by a, a Catholic priest and once by a Baptist and some other things I had done and it seemed to clear it up. But that goes along with what I was talking about earlier. This kind of stuff, is, it can be dangerous, guys. I'm just sending fair warning. I've been doing this a long time and I've had some crazy stuff happen. And so have some of my friends, you know, and uh, you got to really, you know, it's not always a cakewalk and you can come back with something. And even with protection, we had stuff happening, you know, so you better uh, mind your P's and Q's at some of these locations. You never know what you're going to get. There are so many people out there who do not protect yourself. And earlier on, you actually mentioned you can't believe that a lot of these groups go in drinking or go in high to these locations. In your opinion, what is the danger of doing that? Well, number one, you know, you're if if you're on some kind of substance, whether it be alcohol or, or narcotics, whatever, you're opening yourself up. Your defenses are down totally. And when you do that, you're opening yourself up for something. That if there is something negative there to attach to you, it's more than likely going to happen. Um, number two, you don't want to, you know, you want to be professional when you go out and investigate. You don't want to come off as a partying group and all this stuff. Um, especially, I mean, my God, if you're trying to help a family, do you think they want someone in there that's uh, drunk? No. <laughs> no, they don't. They want professionals. They want people that are really there to try to help them. And you hear these horror stories of these other groups. You know, there was, a, what was that group that went down and burnt down that beautiful mansion in, uh, what was it, Louisiana or South Carolina? It's like an 1800s mansion. Uh, and they're playing with fire and they're all drinking, smoking dope and burnt the place down. You know, so, um, you know, just don't do it, guys. Don't do it. That's, that's not the time or place to be doing that stuff. Do you think then you listen to a case like that and immediately I, I hear that and I think, man, that's a real lack of respect, not only for the historic places, but for ghost hunters as well. Do you feel then that we are in this field our own worst enemies and that's probably the reason why so many people in the mainstream refuse to take anything we do seriously? Oh, absolutely. Uh, if one group goes down and does something so stupid like that, it gives everyone a bad name. You know, there. You know, people are their own worst enemy. And when you have groups that are supposedly representing the paranormal field, saying they're, you know, I've heard horror stories of groups going in and charging people to help them out. I mean, that's you know, that's not what you do. They're 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 people needing help. You know, if you can't do it, guess what? There's all kinds of sites out there like. Uh, paranormalsocieties.com for instance is one. You can go on there if you can't do it yourself that you need to get paid to go there you you find a group that's got a good reputation around that area and you pass it on to them. You don't charge people to go investigate okay? You just don't do it. To me that's just totally wrong. I have a question from Claudia here. Claudia is saying, David do you know or do you have friends here in the Space Out Radio S, uh, or that's for me, actually. See, that's what happens <laughs> That's what happens when you read on the fly. Well, let me just quickly that's get that. Okay. Oh, okay, I, I read it wrong here. She's saying, David, you have a lot of friends here in the SOR Space Travelers because we all had our own experiences, and we wouldn't require absolute truth because experiences is all you had to have to have to know that the paranormal is real. Would you agree with that? Well, yeah, I mean, um, I would, actually, because experience is experience. It's just that if you weren't there to experience it with that person, how can you say it didn't happen to them if you weren't there? You know, either way, yeah, sure, you could say, well, that's BS, but you weren't there. You can't tell people they didn't experience what they experienced, you know. Um, it's with anything, you know. Um yeah, sure, you'd like to have some proof of their experiences and whatnot, but you have to take everything 
at face value unless you were actually there. And that's just the way it is with the paranormal, you know. Um, it is what it is. You have to, you know, if you want to go further in depth with that person and maybe, you know, try to document something that they say they experienced, then, yeah, by all means do it. But I, I wouldn't just discount people. Yeah, there's crazies out there and there's people that, see things and that they need medication and stuff, but it is what it is, you know. Who's to say there's not some kind of negative entity causing them to have some kind of hallucinations? We don't know that yet, you know, so you got to take it with a grain of salt and move on and move forward. Final question for you tonight, and this one comes from Trip in our chat room on Spreaker. With your experience, what you've seen, and what you have learned, have you ever called out any group for faking evidence? Well, no, I haven't. Um, I've seen a lot of things where folks have, you know, showed where people have faked things. To be honest, I don't have time to go over and check other people's evidence because guess what? I'm just too busy. I have my own evidence review, you know, that I spend hundreds and hundreds of hours going over you know, recordings and freaking video trying to see what I captured. I don't have time to scrutinize other people's stuff. Yeah, and, you know, I think it's great that people do do that. And if you catch people faking it, yeah, you know, by all means, do it. You know, um, we that's the last thing. It goes right along with those folks that go out drinking and stuff and everything else on investigations. It, it ruins it for the people who really do this uh, and take it seriously, you know. Yeah, you, you, we don't want fakes in this field. We don't want people faking evidence. You know, not at all. And on that note, my friend, we got about a minute left with you. Where can people find your information about your hauntings, your experiences, what you're covering with David Weatherly at all? Yeah, you can go to my website. It has links to all of my stuff and Society of the Supernatural stuff. It's www.davespinksparanormalinvestigator.com. You have links to Society of the Supernatural. That's my my group, that, uh, and David Weatherly and Sean Austin. We call ourselves uh, Society of the Supernatural. You can also go to uh, Two Crows Paranormal at uh, blogspot.com. That's Weatherly site. Great author. They call him the Encyclopedia of the Paranormal. He's a wealth of knowledge, and I'm very proud to be working with him and Sean. Uh, we have a unique dynamic, and we got a lot of cool upcoming stuff for you guys. So check out our channels on YouTube and Periscope, and uh, we we'll hope to see you out there, man. Come and see us at some of the events we're speaking at. Absolutely. I wish you were in Boston in a couple of weeks, because I'm going to be there for the Provincetown Paracon speaking on paranormal media of all topics. So it's going to be good. Oh, cool. Absolutely. Yeah, man, I'm sure we'll meet up sometime, Dave. One of these days, my friend. i got to wrap this thing up. If you're listening in on the Spaced Out Radio side, you hear Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal, our resident guitar god. He takes us in and brings us home every single night on Spaced Out Radio. We appreciate you f- helping us out this week bringing in new listeners, spreading it around social media. It's been a lot of fun. I will be back on Monday. Butch Witkowski, Strange Days. It'll be a lot of fun, my friends. Thank you so much for doing that. I'm going to go enjoy the weekend. You enjoy yours. Don't forget, Spaced Out Weekend is up next with James Tyson and Elizabeth Anglin, Saturday and Sunday night, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time at spacedoutradio.com and for you our valued listeners tell a friend spread the word because here at Space Out Radio we own the night